In 2005, gaming was in a golden age. The previous year, both Half-Life 2 and Halo 2 released, and to say that the first-person shooter genre was packed to the brim with modern classics would be a bit of an understatement. For one, I was laid off, so I don't work tomorrow, which is great because Halo 2 is... There was a certain competitive spirit in the air during this time. There weren't any battle passes or microtransactions. The way your game made money was by selling copies, and the way you sold copies was by your game just being downright better than everyone else's. Around this time, a dev studio called Monolith Productions proved they understood this, and released a game so technically impressive and ahead of its time that many shooters today can't hold a candle to it. This game was called Fear, and while the experience was immortalized as a gaming class, Classic, it never quite reached the fame of Half-Life or Halo. This was thanks to the extreme mishandling of the sequels. Publisher interference, clashing studios, creative differences. Over time, these elements eroded the quality and vision of the games, leaving only the skeleton of an IP that once held promise. This isn't a story I'm about to tell you. It's a cautionary tale about the dangers of losing sight of what really matters when creating a good video game. Today, we're looking at how I hit first game tales spun into a near forgotten franchise, how greed and ignorance gets in the way of creativity. Today we're looking at how fear went from full of potential to wasted potential. Hello everybody and welcome to my Fear series retrospective. Now this is actually a supercut of four different videos that I made about the Fear series and when I wrote them, I wrote them with the intention of being able to edit them into a smooth overarching video for the people that kind of like watching your hours long series retrospective. This video is the culmination of about two and a half months of work, hundreds of hours of editing, researching, voiceover, all that stuff. So if you really enjoy the video at any point, just either subscribe, like, comment, or all of it, it all helps me and I really appreciate it. With all of that out of the way, let's begin our journey into the twisted world of fear, beginning with the 2005 original. Now something interesting to note about this game is that something that sets it apart from the sequels is that this had pretty much no development issues. Monolith Productions set out to make an action FPS horror and they just did that. <laughs> The game is a love child of multiple horror media influences, with most of them being Japanese. Mostly it took inspiration from movies like The Ring, The Grudge, Memento Mori, Dark Water, the list goes on. But something I've always found fascinating about the game is the inverse of normal J-horror. There's games like Resident Evil or The Evil Within, which are made by Japanese studios making American-based games with Japanese culture injected into them, which could be clearly felt while playing them. Jake, please Before stop. Put a bullet Just in your put head. your gun down. Drop your weapon. Don't do this. This game, on the other hand, was developed by an American studio, which took Japanese influences and injected American culture back into the concepts. And the result to me has always felt a little bit like an alternate version of Resident Evil. The main concepts of big shadowy plots, evil corporations, and scary monsters are all there, but you can see that they've been constructed using a completely different lens. Anyway, getting down to the real details, in the game you play as silent protagonist Point Man, who has no real name, doesn't talk, doesn't have a personality, and also doesn't really seem to care what's happening in the campaign, so I'd say pretty stock standard for an early 2000s FPS protagonist. The whole premise of the plot is that Point Man is posted to fear, a secret government task force that combats paranormal threats. And when a corporation's failed science experiment gets loose, he's a part of the team that gets called in to clean up the mess. Anyway, this is all obviously stuff we're going to talk about later, so to stop me from banging on too much, let's just get into it. So the game starts with almost a dream-like cutscene. A man in a room is on his knees and a small girl approaches him. As he screams we see scenes of soldiers gearing up and of the man killing security guards. Finally for one more shot we see him eating someone. <laughs> Next 
Next thing, we're slammed point blank into Point Man's shoes in Fear HQ, where we receive a briefing of an urgent mission from our handler Rodney Betters, who I'm also dressed up as for this episode. Betters tells us that the man in the cutscene is named Paxton Fettel, and he's the subject of a top secret program at the Armor Camp Technology Corporation, or ATC. Fettel is a test to see if a commander could psychically control troops, and as per the cutscenes, it seems like he can, and Betters tells us that he's taken an entire battalion of clone soldiers with him. So with Fettel going rogue, it's up to fear to track him down, and setting off, Point Man suddenly gets a strange vision. What's the first thing? Yeah, it's uh, probably nothing. Arriving in Fettel's area, Betters tells us to go get him, and getting out of the car, we take control of Point Man. At this exact point, something that always strikes me is not the controls or really anything interactive in general, it's the atmosphere. This whole area feels cold, and this feeling is absolutely a testament to the level design in this game, because while fear does lack a lot of level location variety, the environments we do visit are extremely well realized. Auburn, the district of this opening part of the game takes place in is an abandoned part of the city for some unknown reason and somehow the design in these levels makes you really feel it. You don't even get that feeling that someone could be watching you from a window or anything. The place just feels dead. Heading into the building you don't find Fettel but instead a man who's been evidently tortured to death. Looks like we're too late, boss. Just leftovers. The transmitter signal's coming from nearby. It's gotta be around there somewhere. Going to the roof, we're ambushed by Fettel, who yammers on about some cryptic stuff before he pieces out, and waking up, Betters tells us that Fettel has gone to a water treatment plant for whatever reason. So after being tasked with following him, we board a helicopter with another unit and set off to the facility. Upon arriving, we go to enter with our squad. The team leader tasks Point Man with finding the gate switch, and heading out to explore, we find one of the only mechanics in the game outside of shooting people. And these are infusions! In the game, you get two infusion types, health and reflex. Health is pretty obvious. Every time you get one of these, it increases Point Man's health by an extra five points. The reflex infusions, on the other hand, increase the amount of time you can spend in slow motion, which I know I haven't talked about yet, but we will get there. And look, the only reason I'm really bringing this up is because A, there's a comically small amount of depth to the gameplay outside of combat, and B, because these things are really, really addictive to find. Through the levels, you'll sometimes see these things, and there's just something that actually Activates in my brain that makes me want to go get it. Let me in. Let me in. I swear, I don't even know why this happens, but my dopamine receptors go off whenever I see the glow of one of these things in a dark room. And now that I've gotten that little rant out of my system, I do have a little question about these upgrades though. Why the fuck is Point Man shooting up every single glowing syringe he finds in the city? There is no way that Fear has been planting these things all around the city to help their operatives, so the next best guess is that these are either street drugs or commonly used medical devices, which in either case, fucking ew. <laughs> Why on earth do you have so much faith in these things, Point Man? Hey guys, if you sent Bioshock protagonist Jack and Fear protagonist Point Man to Detroit, who do you think would get hepatitis first? Finding the gate controls, we flip it, hearing the sound of gunfire nearby, and heading back to our squad, they've, uh, melted? In a vision, we can see a young girl killing the soldiers, and naturally, after seeing something like that, we continue the mission alone, and enter our first fight. So this is an enemy named the Replica Soldier. In the lore, Replica Forces are a part of the package that comes with Psychic Commanders. In Fear 1, we go up against the fourth generation of these guys, and they're essentially cloned super soldiers, heightened reflexes, heightened accuracy, and zero hesitation. They don't think for themselves, only carrying out orders they receive from their commander, who in this case is Paxton Fettel. According to the Armor Cam Field Guide, this program had its roots in the Vietnam War, where the idea of having absolute control of your ground force 
forces to allow for easier coordination was becoming a rapidly attractive thought. And by the time of Fear 1, Armor Cam has cracked the problem somehow. So long story short, these soldiers are just extensions of Fettel's will, with all of them pretty much being linked into one brain. And the game does a really, really good job at displaying this, because the AI in this game is smart. And I'm talking about the levels of smart that we still don't see in enemy AI on a normal basis today. To break it down, the enemies operate off a system called GoApp, or Goal Orientated Action Planning. Each soldier and squad has a goal that isn't predetermined, but instead one they choose. The easiest way to explain it would be to say that the system is reactionary. A squad's overall goal might be to defend an area, and an individual soldier's job within that squad might be to patrol said area. Then when Point Man shows up, his job is all of a sudden to kill Point Man and balance his role of defending the area. From here, the soldier has options based on what's happening. Is Point Man in the open? I can shoot him. Is he shooting at me? Maybe I should go into cover. Is Point Man in cover? Maybe I can flank or maybe I can throw a grenade. Each of these soldiers has the capacity to make these decisions based on what they know about the situation and the system gets more and more layered the bigger the enemy squad is. If Point Man is hiding in cover, the squad may decide that the best plan of action is for two soldiers to aim in the area they last saw Point Man while another flanks and if there aren't any flank routes, two can aim on Point Man's position while one tosses a grenade. This system is still one of the mind-boggling things about fear. In a lot of games there comes a point when you've got the AI figured out and you can almost play with their behaviours, but in fear you'll probably never see the same behaviour twice because the AI is actively adapting to its situation. It's a learning robot. And don't get me wrong, there are ways to game the system, but you're never going to see the same reaction to you messing with their tactics. While one soldier might see fit to hide behind a corner and wait for you when he can't find you, another soldier in the same scenario might decide it's best to push up or flank to your last known position. And I know all this sounds like it would be unfair since the AI sounds like it's just as smart as the player, but it's really pretty balanced in regards since the soldiers won't execute an action or make a decision without telling their squad mates. The enemies actually do have to communicate with their team if they're going to do something for the other soldiers to know what's going on. This means you can eavesdrop on whatever strategy they're cooking up and then plan a counter. Another thing I really like about the system is once again if a soldier doesn't know something they just don't know. It really annoys me in those games where one enemy sees you and suddenly everyone in the area just has GPS coordinates to your exact location, but here that isn't the case. Like in this clip, I killed a replica that strayed too far from his squad and they have no idea what happened to him. All they heard was the gunshot, they can't reach their buddy on the radio, and they are freaking out. In fact, they know so little about what's happening, they won't even go along with their buddy's plan when he wants to push in. <laughs> It's little things like this and other tiny details like replicas noticing when you use your flashlight or make a loud noise nearby that makes the enemies feel really smart. Not just stormtroopers for you to blast through, but legitimate threats, each in their own capacity. Now that's just a little snapshot of the gameplay and it's pretty incomplete because I haven't even really talked about the other side of the coin. I haven't talked about what the amazing man of points can do, but considering that we're still technically at the very start of the game and point man is waiting for me to stop talking about AI, we should probably just get to it. So after our first engagement with replica forces, we make our way through some warehouses until we run into the little girl again who flings us out a window. <laughs> He's alive. Should I call in a medevac? He doesn't appear to be injured. Waking up, the game actually starts for real, as the fear team medic Jin finds us and sends us on our way to find Paxton. You're lucky to be alive. Like they don't already know that? Are you saying that I'm stupid? From here on, the rest of the level is just a lot of shooting and there's not much to say about it, but I would like to talk about the actual level design, because in its own special way to me, the docks are beautiful. For me, this fondness of the atmosphere probably comes down to games I've been influenced by in my life. Half-Life 2 specifically was one of my first FPS games, and that thing has you trudging through every kind of back alley environment there is. Literal back alleys, sewers, old canals, abandoned towns. The game gave me a taste for these old, forgotten environments. 
environments. It made Urban Decay one of my favorite environment designs in gaming and even influenced me to do some urban exploring when I was younger. So with this taste acquired, when I played Fear for the first time, it was like crack. Why are you going there? It's a bit of crack. So many environments in the game are just decaying, dying, old, abandoned, and just downright drab. It's clear that the city of Fairport isn't exactly thriving and I fucking love it. Anyways, the water treatment facility is a pretty great starting level for the game because there's just so much you don't know. Through the area, we can learn through listening to voicemails and hacking laptops that Armacam, the corporation that created Paxton Federal, is using the water treatment facility to monitor readings coming from the Auburn district in Fairport. The information you receive about the overall plot in both this level and the next is actually pretty eerie in the way that it blends with the whole atmosphere. You're making your way through this facility fighting soulless soldiers, seeing the visage of a little girl out of the corner of your eye in the darkness, and all while picking up the pieces about a big corporation trying to cover something up. Something is really off here, you can feel it, and once again I'll say that this game feels cold. Oh yeah, we haven't talked about the little girl yet. If you guys know anything about fear, then you probably know who this girl is by name at least, but I won't spoil anything because at this point, a first time player also knows nothing about her except that she is fucking scary. <laughs> Fear just does this amazing thing where it never gives you a break. Gunfights feel lonely and sections between these fights are extremely daunting. Usually there will be heavy ambience that plays and as soon as you see your flashlight flicker and get a signal from an unknown source, get ready for some haunted house shenanigans. Sometimes the girl just appears when you're not expecting it, jump scaring you, and at other points you might just catch her watching you. I've always felt she's kind of like a G-Man type character that you can always just kind of see in the distance. Except in this case, the only difference is that G-Man doesn't just jump out of Gordon every five seconds and go, Boo, Mr. Freeman, I got you good, didn't I? There's not much more to note about this level other than the fact that we hear that Spencer has gone missing. He's the bold guy from the start of the game, by the way, and um, he never shows back up again. I'm not joking, he shows up at the start of the game, you hear he's gone missing, and he, he never comes back up, he's gone. Like, it, it is a little eerie, but it's just kind of funny that he's just introduced and then he just disappears. Around this part, we once again find that Paxton has once again escaped, finding another one of his victims. At this point, it's beginning to become clear that Paxton is conducting a kind of investigation, moving from place to place, looking for something or someone. All we really have at this point is a name, Alma. Where is Alma? I don't know what you're talking about. Some secrets get buried deeper than others, but I know where to dig. No, wait, wait, you've got the wrong guy! Hush now, Mr. Moody. The time for talk is done. After this, replica forces begin pulling out of the water treatment plant, and it's clear that the party is officially over, with reports coming in that there's been an attack on Armor Cam's headquarters. So fighting our way to the exit, a Black Hawk comes and picks us up. Now on this helicopter ride, I actually have a fun fact for you. We are officially a quarter way through the game. Yeah, this thing is short, and in my opinion, it's one of the game's downsides, because through this whole game, all you really do is chase Paxton Fettel from one location to the next, to the next, to the next, and it begins to fall into a bit of a pattern. Point Man enters a location, goes to get Paxton, Paxton gets away, and Point Man exits the location. At a certain point, you just begin to feel like you're not even a part of the story. You're just an NPC chasing the protagonist in his campaign. It's kind of like if in Black Ops 2, literally every mission was just like, we gotta kill Menendez. Nothing else, just every mission was like an assassination on Menendez. Another thing that hurts the story is that everything goes wrong, but in a pretty smooth kind of way. At the start of the campaign, you're a fear operative and nothing really changes through the story. You move from one area to the next and pretty much every area ends with Rodney going, damn, he got away buddy, we'll get him next time though. It literally just feels like you're going through the motions of being an anti-paranormal agent. Like at some points it feels like none of the characters really care, like they're just 
doing it because it's their job. Is it, is it a Monday or something in Fairport? There's no point when fear is like, damn, we're a little in over our heads here, or we lose contact with our handler. We just spend the whole game taking on an army, and both Rodney and Point Man are just chill with it. Arriving at Army Cam, all our army buddies get mowed down, and we have to head in alone. This part of the game is kind of where my middle of the road opinion of the whole experience comes from. On one hand, I have fond memories of how the game makes me feel in its overall atmosphere, but playing through it is honestly a bit of a slog, and I think that comes mostly from the army cam section of the game. About 50% of your total playtime in the campaign is spent in armor cam, and I'll tell you, it is not a good thing. There's points in this game when you'll just be wondering if it's even worth looking around, because there never seems to be anything in these levels that's relevant to the story. Offices look like offices, they're neat and tidy, and yeah, that's about it. Apart from the creepy little girl jumping out at you every couple of levels, there's just not a whole lot in this area that makes it interesting. But at the same time, a huge brunt of the story context comes out of these levels, which makes for a slightly annoying gameplay loop of fight squads, something spooky happens, you listen to a voicemail, repeat. Oh, and do that for two hours, by the way. Like I said, it just feels like you're going through the motions at some points. But I don't want to just complain in this video. So to talk about some interesting stuff in this area, I'll start with our main objective. While we're still attempting to apprehend Paxton Fettel, we have a few other things on our agenda, like locating a squad that's gone missing inside the building. And on our way to their last known position, we have to travel through the ground floor. And do you hear that? It almost sounds like buzzing. This is the assassin, and I've now officially mentioned an enemy by name, which means that we've entered the enemy section of the video. What? So Fear 1 has a few enemy types to cover. The Assassin, the Rev 6, the UAVs, ATC Security, Heavies, and the Replica Force family. The enemies you most commonly face in the game is of course the good old Replica Soldiers, and I'm not going to go into extreme detail on these guys because I don't really think it matters much, but Replicas come in all sorts of types. You have Snipers, Scouts, Tactical Specialists, Elites, and personally, I find it pretty impressive that the devs went through all the trouble of making new models for all these different types of enemies because the differences in all of these enemies are pretty minimal. Scouts are weaker and have worse aim, tactical replicas wear heavier armor, snipers won't give away their position until they take the first shot. Like seriously in gameplay all of these guys act pretty much the same in a fight so it doesn't really matter. The special enemies is where the gameplay actually begins to broaden a little bit however. The assassin uses cloaking tech to get the drop on the player and only uses melee attacks making it one of the least effective effective enemies in the game, since when they're idle, you can hear them from a mile away, and once you get over the initial shock of seeing a soldier stuck to the wall waiting for you, it's pretty easy to dispatch these guys. The Rev-6 is just a mech that kind of walks slowly after you while firing missiles, and it's pretty imposing the first time you meet one, but it's also a pretty damn easy enemy to take down. Just peek around the corner and unload all of your bullets into it for about a minute, and it will be pretty dead. The UAVs are a bit of a weird one, they're shielded drones that fly around shooting lasers at you, the heavies are just super heavily armoured replicas that have a rivet gun, armour cam security are just reskinned replica forces but they have worse tactics than replica forces. Okay so you might be wondering why I am rattling these off, and it's because fighting them isn't that interesting, and it's not because they're not interesting enemies, it's because they're not used in interesting ways. Like for example, only 10 replica assassins show up in the entire game game. That's right, the cool cloaking dudes only show up 10 times max, and it's never when any other enemy types are around. This also goes for other enemies like the Rev-6 or the UAVs. Through the game, none of these enemies are used in interesting combinations. You'll know it's time to fight some assassins because in a scripted sequence you see one run away in the distance, or you will know it's time to fight some UAVs because you hear one flying around close by but you don't see it. But the weird thing is that all of these signifiers very quickly become a notification to the player that you won't be fighting any other enemy 
Mimi type for the next five minutes. It just feels a little strange to me. One of the only reoccurring enemy combos we get through the game are the heavy paired with some replica soldiers and that's about it. Which is a little disappointing for me because it's clear that all of these special enemy types are suited to specific jobs and yet the game never feels comfortable throwing a wrench at the player and saying, hey, what if you had to fight some replica soldier guys but also some assassins at the same time? Or what if you had to fight a Rev 6 and some drones at the same time. It feels like the enemy types are a little wasted and used in a very safe way. Gameplay wise, fear feels a lot like a memory test. The game throws a curveball at you, the player deals with it, and a few levels later, the game throws the exact same curveball at you again. It's almost like it's saying, hey buddy, do you know how to deal with this one? Uh, yeah. I do. It feels like there's a very specific solution to many enemy encounters in the game, and those same enemy encounters are just recycled multiple times, which is something that extends to the replica soldier encounters. And I'll just be clear here, this next point is not criticism. To set the stage, I'll use an example with that being the Batman Arkham games. In those games, the combat scenarios are not hard. If you're playing on PC, all you really need to remember are two things. Mouse 1 to attack, Don't let it mouse 2 to counter. The simplicity of the system makes the combat a breeze, but what makes the gameplay addicting is how well you perform. The higher combo Batman gets, the faster he moves. You can unlock special takedowns, you can destroy enemy weapons, and it feels great. The challenge isn't fighting the enemy, it's seeing how well you can beat the enemy, and that's the same for fear. Once you learn the way the replica soldiers react to different scenarios, they essentially become your playthings. And to tell you why, I need to actually explain a little bit about how Point Man controls in this game. Pretty much our dude is pretty capable from step one. Pressing control sends us into slow motion where we move slightly faster and aim easier. Right clicking allows him to melee and this attack changes depending on input. Moving forwards and crouching as you melee will make our character slide. Jumping while moving forwards will allow you to bicycle kick the enemy and simply jumping while meleeing will have point man dish out a kick. Now when I first played fear I played it like a cover shooter because if you're sighted by an enemy it could be very well game over for you. But for this video when I play through it again Again, I started thinking, why is a close ranged ability more important in the game than aiming down sights? Pressing mouse 2 doesn't aim your gun, it dishes out a melee attack. I thought about this and it suddenly hit me. In this game you play as a single guy going up against an army of strategically inclined soldiers, so the only logical counter to that is to be unpredictable. Using unorthodox methods of fighting to confuse the AI that is using orthodox methods is the best way to play this game. It's hard to explain because the idea is to be unpredictable. But I'll say that later in the game, I was throwing grenades less to kill enemies or even flush them out, but instead to confuse them. Enemies in this game are also pretty easily staggered, so a lot of the time if an enemy was hunkered down behind cover, I would just rush them while firing my shotgun. The experience really devolves into a serious of Hail Mary moves from the player, which I think is really cool. Figuring out that the best solution for fighting a thinking enemy is to not give them time to think and exploiting that fact is just something that brings the gameplay together for me. It also helps that the more you experiment with game mechanics, the easier your life gets. Like for example, if you're trigger happy enough, you'll eventually figure out that power boxes and fire extinguishers are explosive, or that you can shoot grenades while they're airborne to detonate them early. There's a lot of variables when it comes to combat in this game, and a lot of the time it comes down to the player preference and how they want to deal with their current situation. This preference bleeds pretty heavily into weapons as well. Usually the weapons you choose to pick up won't be starved for ammo due to how many enemies are packing those same weapons, so the game encourages you to bring the tools that work for you into gunfights. For this video I won't really go into weapons too much because it's kind of your stock standard early 2000s kit. You have some pistols, some rifles, some shotguns, some explosives, proximity mines, you get the idea. But one weapon I do want to talk about is the one you can find while wandering around armor camp, and this weapon is the Type 7 Particle Weapon. Truly. 
I guess you could call it the sniper rifle of the game, but I'll raise you and say that it's the only weapon in the game. Oh, you think I'm joking? No, no, no. If you pick this gun up, you are not gonna wanna put it down. And this is for two reasons. Reason one, it's an insta-kill on most enemies. Reason two, it turns enemies' dead bodies into charred skeletons, which is fucking awesome. Anyway, that's all I really have to yap on about with the gameplay for now. On a surface level, I'll say that it is still a first-person shooter, so for all the depth of gameplay I've talked about, the best way to solve all your problems is to just shoot. So the gameplay can't really make it any more enjoyable to be trudging through the same 10 off office rooms for two hours straight. Have I mentioned that I don't like the armor cam levels yet? Back on track, we eventually find what's left of the missing squad we've been looking for, which seems to be not a whole lot. Jin shows up to inspect the scene, and we can actually see the little girl who's been stalking us on this balcony just watching. From here, our objective goes back to finding Paxton Fettel, who's apparently going after a girl named Alice Wade that's in the building, and- Hello? Oh, it's you. Oh yeah. I forgot to tell you about him. So earlier in our journey through Armor Cam, we met this distinguished gentleman who goes by the name of Norton Mapes. And holy shit, I cannot stand this guy. Can you help me get into the network? What am I, an IS lackey? Tell you what, you disable the local security system and I'll see what I can do about the server. I can disable it remotely once I'm locked in. No, you can't. It's on a separate network. Up until the point that we meet Mapes, the game has a pretty dark and moody tone, and also, let me mention, a pretty realistic art style. But then this cartoonishly fat man falls through the ceiling and gives us a nice big injection of tonal whiplash. Like, I don't know what the devs were thinking when they made this character. He's not even funny enough to be comic relief, and he's obviously meant to be comic relief because every time he shows up, this goofy ass soundtrack starts playing. No, 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 no. Another thing I really dislike about him is that he's a bad guy. Every time we meet him in armor cam, he exploits our help, then disappears. And just after this point, he actually tries to kill us by enabling the security system. See this button? I wonder what this does. Also, during this sequence where we're chasing him, every time he shows up, it's just a little sting sound effect of his soundtrack just plays. It can't just be me that feels like they're getting mixed messages right, because is this guy meant to be a threat or a joke? Because if he's a threat, he's not very threatening, and if he's a joke, he's not very funny. Anyway, I don't want to talk about this guy anymore, because he just makes my blood boil. But you might be wondering why he's trying to kill us. Well, it's because he's trying to cover up something at Armor Cam, and once we figure this out, the game actually starts to get pretty interesting. All through the Armor Cam HQ levels, there's a bunch of voicemails that you can listen to, and laptops you can hack into that give you information and by piecing the story that it tells all together, we can learn that there is a schism within the top management at the company. Overall, the info we get is that there are two sides, comprised of Genevieve R. Steed, the president of Armacam, and Harlan Wade, a high-ranking scientist within the organization. Harlan is mostly pissed off at Genevieve because she reopened an abandoned Armacam facility that Harlan used 20 years earlier for a failed project called Origin. Genevieve sent two teams into the facility, however, they disappeared and is now still trying to figure out ways to reopen the place. Through voicemails, we can hear that Harlan has been constantly warning that reopening the facility would be catastrophic. And when we correlate some other info, it starts making sense why. Once again, through voicemails and hacking laptops, my favorite way of learning video game lore, we can learn that Paxton Fettel was a part of Project Origin until something called a synchronicity event took place. Because of this, Origin, the project, and the facility was shut down. Now, there's three things I want to touch on to help you understand what's happening here. To avoid any confusion, I want to state that this game takes place in 2025. The second thing is that yes, Harlan Wade is the father of Alice Wade, the woman that we're rescuing. And the third thing is that the vault that Fettel is searching for is also the origin facility. So mixing all this together, we're slowly building a picture of what's happening here. Fettel is attempting to locate the origin facility, and we can assume that the Alma he's looking for is there too. In the level, this isn't the only connection we have to Project Origin. While wandering around Armacam, we run into this guy tied to a chair named Aldus Bishop, who seems to have some idea 
idea of what's going on here. Trying to evacuate him, he's killed by armor cam security, but through voicemails we can learn that he was working with Alice Wade to investigate the Auburn district for reasons that I'll get into later. Anyway, back on our objective, we are still set on rescuing Alice Wade. So making our way across the armor cam facility and rescuing her from the replica forces, she tells us that she won't go anywhere without her dad, who's gone to the Origin facility. I need to get to my dad. Where is he? Some kind of classified facility. I've never heard of it. There isn't even a street address, just UTM coordinates. The entrances are all hidden, but I have passcodes. Beginning our escort of Alice Wade, we play through a really fun elevator sequence where all the replica forces on their floors just press the elevator button and set ambushes for us on each floor. Why are all the floors lighting up? Uh-oh. Somebody's pressing the call buttons. And I just love how much this sequence clashes since you get into a huge gunfight and then you just get back into the elevator with there's all this cheery music until you get into your next gunfight. Get ready! <laughs> Here we go again. This sucks. You don't have to kill everybody. Sorry I freaked out. I'm just not used to being shot at. Anyway, making it to the rooftop, the chopper we were meant to catch is destroyed, and Alice decides to get to the Origin facility by herself by heading down to the parking garage. We give chase but end up missing her by a few seconds. But it's okay, because Rodney just tells us to head to the garage roof for extraction, and man, the soundtrack goes hard. I'll tell you something, you will not find me in the club on a Friday night, but if they're playing Fear original soundtrack Garage Battle, you better fucking believe I'm pulling up. <laughs> Good to see you in one piece. Making it to the roof, we finally fucking leave Armor Cam HQ and like, wow. That, that, that whole section is just way too long. Like, all of the footage you just saw, just in the office area, just think about doing that for two hours. There's no deviation. It's just mindlessly walking around samey environments. And if there's one thing I'm glad the devs actually listen to between games, it's this one critique that all of their environments just kind of look the same. But don't worry, the low point of the game for me, at least, is now over. And in my opinion, I think the second half of the game is why I actually like it. See, the chopper we boarded is taking us to the Origin facility in Auburn. And seeing the district from the sky while knowing about the history is kind of eerie. Back in Armor Cam HQ, we could learn that Bishop and Alice were trying to figure out what was wrong with Auburn. According to their records, about 20 years earlier, people began feeling uneasy in the area. Accompanying that uneasiness was nausea and headaches. This led to the district slowly becoming abandoned until the time the game takes place, where it's a complete ghost town. The whole reason Armicam was running tests at the water treatment facility is because the very groundwater in Auburn seems to be contaminated with something. I like Auburn so much in this game because, for me, I was more excited to visit it than to find out all the answers for, like, who the little girl was. And that's because through the game, everything points to this area. The water treatment facility says there's something leaking out of that place. Armor Cam is buzzing with paranoia about the area and seeing it from the air in the chopper, seeing all the lights and yet knowing no one's down there, it's eerie and it's fucking excellent world building. Before we make it to the origin facility, our chopper is down and we crash into an old hotel. With our companions needing medical attention, Point Man continues on by himself again and we have to fight through replica forces to make our escape. Once on the street, we can truly appreciate the ghost town that Auburn's become and the supernatural activity continuously gets stronger the closer we get to the vault in this area. This 
exact moment is when I realized something about fear. The atmosphere that this game spits out, it's a specific feeling that you get through most of the levels in the game, and that is the feeling of being alone. The ambience of each level feels cold and distant. The sparse allies you have either communicate with you over the radio or just vanish as quickly as they appear. The enemies you fight aren't even really people, they're all just drones controlled by Paxton. The game just has this incredible ability to make it feel like you're completely alone, even in the middle of a gunfight. The Auburn levels especially get this feeling across perfectly with the dark alleyways and the abandoned apartments. But unfortunately, good things aren't meant to last and the levels set in the alleys are some of the shortest in the game for whatever reason, and we only get to fight through the streets for about 20 minutes before we finally reach the Origin facility. But you can't do this to me. Upon entering the place, we begin getting a lot more answers, since the voicemails and laptops we can hack give us way more info to go on. Pretty much, Project Origin was based all around a single psychic, and the goal was to see if this individual's power could be replicated in order for Armor Camp's Psychic Commander project to succeed. This individual was none other than Alma, the woman that Paxton has been looking for. And the scientists on Project Origin figured that there was no way to replicate Alma's power other than genetically, which meant that Alma would have to be bred. So, with Lee researcher Harlan Wade using his genetic material, Alma was impregnated when she was around 14. At 15, she gave birth to two babies that Armor Cam calls the prototypes. The first prototype was apparently a failure, but the second was not, and he was given the name Paxton Fettel. Yep, that's right, Paxton Fettel's motivations are finally revealed. Paxton is Alma's son, and he's just trying to free his mother. For all this time, Alma has been kept in a medically induced coma and she's now about to be freed. Working our way through the facility, we can find that Harlan Wade is here with the goal of freeing Alma. As well as that, Paxton has made his way to the facility and Norton fucking mapes. But it's okay, because Harlan shoots him. I'm just doing my job. Talking to Mapes, he tells us that Alma cannot be allowed to go free, and if it comes to it, we need to destroy the entire facility. So after a bit of busy work, we manage to open the vault and head in. Once inside, everything starts to come into focus. We find Paxton knelt over the body of a dead Alice Wade, and in a bit of a proto-boss fight, he tells us that we are one of Alma's sons as well, and yeah, that's another big reveal that Paxton just kind of mutters out. <laughs> Point Man is the first and failed prototype child of Alma. However, this doesn't really affect Point Man too much because he, he doesn't care. He just shoots Paxton in the head. <laughs> I will set her free. With Paxton dead, we can move through the facility some more and find that all of his soldiers have now been deactivated. And taking the elevator, we finally make it to the center of the vault. Heading to the control room, we can see that Harlan's beat us here. And as he begins the procedure of freeing Alma, he tells us a story. This is the big reveal of the game. Alma has been dead for 20 years. She's the girl that's been stalking us. She's the point man's mother, and now her spirit has been reunited with her body, allowing her to finally take revenge. As Alma attempts to leave the facility, point man switches to plan B and damages the site's power generators. As we make a break for the exit, Alma sends a manifested nightmares after us, and surviving the onslaught, we make it out onto an abandoned street. The sky is beginning to light up in anticipation of a new day, and against all all odds.
In the epilogue, Point Man has luckily survived, and we're picked up by a chopper. From the air, we can see that all of Auburn has been leveled by the explosion, and just as Jin asks what happened to Alma... What was that sound? And that's fear. Now, you probably have no idea what actually just happened, right? Well, that's okay. During this breakdown, I've tried to summarize information as best I can, but the thing is about this game is that you're given a lot of info that's out of order. So I didn't really want to bring out the timeline just in the middle of the video. So to help you understand, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of the full lore. Starting at the very beginning, Alma is actually named Alma Wade. And yes, she's Harlan Wade's daughter. As a young girl, Alma has had reoccurring nightmares and terrifying visions of monsters. One of Harlan's colleagues at Armor Camp suggested that she might be a psychic, and after conducting some tests, they found this to be the case. Over the next few years, Armor Camp experimented cruelly on Alma, with Harlan leading the research. And yeah, I hope that if you had any idea that Harlan Wade was a good guy or doing anything good, this is changing your mind. At some point, Alma began becoming aggressive towards the staff working on Origin, giving them hallucinations, nightmares, and such. In Fear Gold Edition, there was actually a live action special feature where a doctor tries to interview Alma but is just instead slowly driven insane by her. To avoid any more of this behavior, she was put into a coma just before she turned 8, and years later she was pulled out and impregnated with two prototypes, made from both her and Origin Research's DNA, including Harlan Wade. Like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Ew! You know, the fact that Point Man is technically inbred now makes his Fear 3 model make a lot of sense, and why it looks so fucking weird. <laughs> At 15, Alma gave birth to Point Man, and just a year later, Paxton fed both of her children were then taken away from her and she was put back into a coma in case they needed to use her again for more prototypes. Later when Paxton was 10, he and Alma somehow connected psychically and caused the synchronicity event that got Origin shut down. Because of all the people Paxton ended up killing, Alma's life support was shut down and the facility was closed. Six days after being taken off life support, Alma's heart stopped, but something stayed behind. Maybe it was the lingering anger of a spirit done untold wrongs, but the area of Auburn that surrounded the facility slowly began to change. The groundwater was tainted with something. People spending time there became sick, and eventually the entire area was abandoned, and it stayed that way for 20 years. In 2025, Genevieve R. Steed, the president of Armacam, decided that she wanted to reopen the facility. However, the teams that were sent inside disappeared, and unbeknownst to Genevieve, she had just reawoken Alma's dormant spirit. Taking the opportunity, Alma found Paxton again, merging their minds in another synchronicity event. In the opening cutscene, we're actually seeing Paxton gain all of his mother's memories. Really, he's feeling everything that was ever done to her. Paxton knew he had to free his mother and began the rampage he goes on in the game. Meanwhile, through all of this, Harlan Wade was living with a guilty conscience. Having tortured his own daughter for science, he decided that enough was enough, and making his way to the Origin facility, he released her as we see in the game. So yeah, that's the story. It's kind of like a messed up family story, and it all comes from the one guy being Harlan Wade, and turns out he's a total piece of shit. Something I really like about Fear is it's not really ever stated whether Alma is a paranormal entity or not. They reference psychic energy all the time, and we don't really know if Alma is a ghost or a spirit or anything like that, which I think is just really cool. It's Is she manifested hate? Is she a ghost? Anyway, even though we've covered everything from the main game, there's just a little bit more to look at with the multiplayer, which is named Fear Combat. Combat. Fear Combat is your average single player shooter multiplayer mode. You get some guns, you get a map, and you kill other players. It's just kind of unremarkable and doesn't really enrich the world of fear since all of the maps have the same problem as the main game, with them being repetitive and boring. You could literally sum up most of the maps in the game by what they are. Some armor cam building, some city block in Auburn, some industrial facility. 
The only map that has a bit of personality is the Asylum, which is actually a lot of fun to explore. Inside the building you can hear almost ghostly cries. There's a clear history behind the place and the layout has actually been thought about. Also, if you head to the basement, you can find a solitary confinement room that my friends and I liked so much that we affectionately dubbed it the Piss Room. So that's fear. My thoughts on the game is that I can tell that I love something about this game, but I just can't figure out what it is. Something that really pulls me out of the game is how you never really feel like you're a part of the story. Point Man is a part of this narrative, but it never seems like he's needed. We spend the whole game just chasing Paxton from one location to the next, and by the end of the game, it feels like you haven't done much. You've failed all of your objectives, but along the way, you've learned why the guy you needed to stop needed to be stopped. And the revelations that Point Man is Alma's son doesn't really hit home at all because Point Man isn't a character, he's a vessel for the player. So with the big reveal I'm not thinking, Ugh, I wonder what Point Man's reaction is going to be to this piece of information because he's not going to react, he's not a character. Going into this retrospective I had an idea that I liked fear and after everything you've heard me say you might be thinking that I don't like it but I do. I like it in a special kind of way. <laughs> For me, there aren't really any in-between factors when it comes to my opinions on the game. The things I love, like the atmosphere, the combat, and the art direction are fucking perfect. They give me that excited kid playing an FPS feeling again, but then the things that don't land really don't land for me. Like how you have to stitch together the story by dropping everything every five minutes to listen to a voicemail. <laughs> Honestly, since the game is meant to be a mystery that's unfolding before you, I don't think they could have done it any other way, but that still doesn't make the way they chose all that great, at least for me. Overall, F.E.A.R. gets a pretty great 8 out of 10. This was a game that had a lot riding on it. The original Fear was another trophy for the FPS genre in the early 2000s. It showed just how deep a story could be in a game. It showed just how advanced an AI could be. It showed just how good a game could look. The OG Fear became the gold standard in a lot of categories for a couple of years before it was eventually surpassed by newer games. And when Fear 2 was announced, people were expecting it to once again show the industry who was boss. But I can tell you right now it didn't and this is very much thanks to the behind the scenes issues going on at Monolith Studios in 2006. Pretty much during the development of the original Fear there was a deal made with a publisher that only the OGs watching will know, a company named Vivendi. Now this deal was absolutely great just as long as Monolith was publishing games through Vivendi Forever. Come 2004, however, Big Dog Warner Bros. Games kicks down Monolith's doors and purchases the dev studio. Fear 1 was released without a hitch, but in 2006, Monolith let everyone know about the elephant in the room. And this elephant was the fact that due to the deal with Vivendi and Warner Bros. being so close in time to each other, some strange stuff was legally happening with the Fear IP. Monolith slash Warner Bros. owned the Fear IP. They owned the game, the story, the character but Vivendi owned the name. This became a huge issue because how can you make a sequel to your game without using the name? They couldn't even mention the in-universe organization of fear. How on earth can you make a sequel when you're missing the central piece of the world? Well, the answer was clear. Don't name it Fear and get someone else to do it for you. That someone turned out to be the fans and in June of 2007, Monolith announced the Name Your Fear campaign. Pretty much they said, hey guys, what would you name Fear if you absolutely could not call it Fear? They took submissions and the final three names came down as Dead Echo, Project Origin and Dark Signal. In the end, Project Origin was chosen as the final, definitive, absolutely uncontested title of Fear 2. Until one year later when Warner Bros bought the Fear rights back and then they just named it Fear 2 and tacked Project Origin onto the back. <laughs> so yeah, it was a little bit of a headache inducing run around here, but it was nothing compared to the actual development. Not being satisfied with how Fear 1 was ported onto consoles, Monolith decided it would be better to create three different versions of Fear 2, each taking 
tailored to the player experience on each platform they were on. <laughs> Like that's ever gonna happen. Yeah, that idea got thrown out pretty quickly, but they were working on a bunch of different versions of fear before it all just got mixed into one, which is just wastes a bunch of time. And just one more element to make it a little more complicated, while Monolith was developing fear 2, Vivendi was developing their own version of fear 2 as well, but I won't be talking about that because this fear 2 morphed into fear 3, which we'll talk about next time. So that's mostly the development of fear 2. As far as actual problems went during the process, this game was in the eye of the storm. Everything around it was pure chaos while they just slowly kind of formed this thing. And once you get into the game, you kind of have to wonder if it was all worth it. This whole back and forth mess for a game that is just pretty all right. But yeah, I know you guys don't just want to hear me talk about what created this game. You want to hear about the actual game. So without further ado, let's get into it. <laughs> Fear 2 begins with a dream. We're in a ruined city and walking through it, we occasionally observe a young girl in a red dress walking away from us. Following her, we find a swing on a tree, dangling over a pit, and upon entering it... We have just stepped into the combat boots of Michael Beckett, an SFOD Tag D operator. I didn't really bring it up in the Fear 1 breakdown, but SFOD or Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta were the dudes who worked with Point Man in the first game and who also got turned to skeletons. In Fear 2, Beckett is a part of a squad within this detachment called Dark Signal and we're being tasked with taking Genevieve Aristide into protective custody. Since intel has come up that indicates the Armacam board of directors might be looking to snuff out any links the company had to the situation at Armacam HQ. After the briefing, we get dropped off in front of Genevieve's apartment with one of our squad mates named Jankowski. And if that name rings a bell, it's because this is the younger brother of Spencer Jankowski, the bold dude that just goes missing in the first game. What the hell are you doing, man? Is that your car? No. Heading inside, everything seems clear on our initial sweep until we link up with the rest of the squad who's found a dead civilian. Heading to a nearby elevator, our vision goes blurry, and one of our squad mates named Keegan is shot by an armor care mercenary. After shooting him and entering the elevator, we ride it to Genevieve's penthouse, where we have to enter a big gunfight with a bunch more of armor cam's mercenaries. I'll talk about gameplay later because honestly, it is probably the least interesting thing about this game, and the one thing I do want to talk about in this penthouse is the atmosphere. As you can probably tell, the opening of Fear 2 takes place during the same period of time that the end of Fear 1 is happening, and going through the opening level with the knowledge of what's about to happen is eerie, and the game knows it. The backing track of this area is nothing but an echoing whine, and as someone who's just played Fear 1, the feeling I get from the ambience is amazing. In Fear 1, you walked through every back alley and sideway in Fairport, you never saw any civilians or anything. One of the things that contributed to the first game's lonely atmosphere was knowing that all this weird shit was happening to you while life was still normal for everyone else. So looking out the window and seeing hundreds of cars zooming down highways all over the city, seeing people going about their lives just like it was implied they were doing in the first game is refreshing yet strangely haunting. For the first time in the Fear series, you don't feel utterly alone. The sun is coming up, people are going to work. But we as the audience know that this is a piece that won't last. I think that's why the ambient track adds so much to the scene. It doesn't sound chirpy or happy, it sounds decaying and old. The game isn't showing us Fairport at sunrise to signify the end of a nightmare, it's signifying the beginning of one. It's just no one knows it yet. After fighting through some squads, we begin having some run-ins with Alma. The first time we actually see her is when we enter this pool room, and no joke, this is one of the best scares in the series. Series. 
Yeah, the devs literally scripted Alma to follow the player until they turn around. Like, there was something just so cool about that to me. <laughs> Further through the level, we see Alma again in the penthouse where she's looking at a music box. Interacting with it, we see a flashback of Alma's childhood. And back in the present, we find that the music box was a switch to open a secret door. Inside, there's a pin board that shows that Genevieve has been keeping tabs on the Origin facility in Auburn for a while now. And once we locate Genevieve, she actually isn't surprised to see us at all. This is pretty much confirmed as she tells us that Beckett and his team are the only ones that can stop Alma. On the monitors we can see Aristide's been monitoring the Origin facility and just as Harlan releases the vengeful spirit, everything stops for us. Sergeant Beckett, what's wrong? What is it? Seeing the visage of Alma, we follow her and making it to the balcony, one of the best moments in the series happens. The Origin facility has just exploded thanks to Point Man's efforts to contain Alma, and from this point in the series, everything changes. For the worst, granted, but we're gonna talk about that later. <laughs> Fading in and out of consciousness, we see the aftermath of the explosion, and just before blacking out for the final time, we see some men and our steed step into view. In the next cutscene, we see Beckett is being operated on with Genevieve overseeing the procedure, but it doesn't seem like they're saving Beckett's life, more like they're doing something to it. Waking up in a hospital room, we receive a radio transmission from a few members of our squad, and our objective is to link up with them. So leaving the room, we go exploring and the atmosphere is immense. No one is around. We're constantly seeing the visage of Alma out the corner of our eye. And on the TV, we get vague reports of the Auburn explosion. The explosion is still unknown. CFNDC is just now giving us information on the story. We're calling in all our sources to try to figure out what's going on. Pretty much right off the bat, this game has way better level design than the first. In the OG Fear, the levels were super open to allow the AI to move around, but it made the environment feel messy and really confusing to traverse. Mostly in this opening part of the game, a pretty good balance is struck between having the areas be explorable while not being confusing, and if you play the games back to back, it's really refreshing. Like looking around actually benefits the players, since you can find lore, tidbits, items, or even just experience a creepy be scripted event. Despite not looking as great as the first fear, the world this one inhabits feels more lived in, which I think is great. I will take substance over style any day. And fear 2, while it doesn't do a lot of things better than fear 1, the things it does do better, it does them really, really well. Making our way out of the hospital, we suddenly witness the execution of a nurse, and the soldier that killed her starts coming after us. Running away, we bump into Genevieve, who tells us that we need to get to something called the TAC lab, and that the men hunting us down are here to cover up evidence for armor cam. Continuing on, we eventually get our hands on a gun and enter our first real fight of the game. And why is it the first real fight, I hear you ask? Well, it's because the operation we underwent gave us none other than point man powers. Wait, you think I'm gonna talk about gameplay now? They, they didn't add anything. <laughs> okay, so that's a little bit of a lie. The gameplay of Fear 2 is the same as Fear 1, but also not. To break this down, let's just get something out of the way. In my opinion, Fear 1's combat systems were bloated, and I'm not talking about the overall combat here, I'm talking about the sheer number of options the player had when it came to fighting. You could lean around walls, there were like seven different types of grenades, and some of those grenades pretty much did the same job the others did. Now, I praised Fear's play your own way approach to combat in my retrospective for it, and I'm only singing a different tune here because Fear 2 is a refined version of that system, and all that refining does is show just how shallow the gameplay was on the player's side of the fence the whole time. In this game, corner leaning is out the window. Grenade types have been rolled into each other to make kind of hybrid, more useful versions of them. Uh, you can cook grenades, but that's about it for the new gameplay stuff in this entry. Essentially, all they've done is removed features while developing 
being the ones they've kept to be more up to date with the likes of Call of Duty at the time. So the gameplay does not really change much to differentiate itself as a sequel. And I feel like that's almost a missed opportunity because just giving Beckett Point Man's powers here narratively hurts the story for me. And that's mostly because these guys are so similar. They control the same, they don't talk, and the only real difference is that people refer to you as Beckett and not Buddy. It also doesn't help that the enemies in the game just aren't the same as the previous one. We'll talk specifics later, but the enemy AI is just as smart as Fear 1, but the level design hinders their deployment. Fear 1 had confusing but open levels that allowed enemies to plan expansive strategies, which just isn't something they have here. Like, how many options does an enemy really have when their arena is a hallway with a couple of rooms with no flanking routes? The AI losing an important edge as well as the gameplay being, if anything, stripped down leaves the entire experience feeling like it's devolved. We're playing Fear 0.5. It's just weird because while I talked highly of the gameplay in Fear 1, I didn't exactly find it fun and it's the same here except now I can't feel the options I have at my fingertips. The depth of the gameplay isn't there. But yeah, that's my little rant about the gameplay over and I had to talk about it now because nothing really happens in this opening level. I mean, a lot actually happens but all of it feels really non-eventful because this feels like the intro and yet this section goes on for nearly two hours. So instead of torturing myself and pretending to find this part of the game interesting, I will give you a rundown of hospital stuff that happens that would be interesting in any other setting but isn't interesting here. Pretty much our radio is hacked by a guy calling himself Snake Fist and he seems to be on our side telling us to get to Wade Elementary School if we want to stop Alma. We meet up with Genevieve and enter the TAC machine but the procedure doesn't go to plan and we're ambushed by the leader of the Alma Care mercenaries called Colonel Vanek. Good morning, Chick P. Yep, he's the Norton Mapes of this game, if you can't tell. We escape Vanek, he tries to kill us, we escape Vanek, we meet some of these freaky guys called Abominations, we find out that this place is not a hospital, but instead an underground army camp facility. One of our squad mates gets hypnotized by Alma and swiftly discombobulated. <laughs> And we finally exit the facility. In my videos, I like to keep a certain amount of flow. So there's a part of me right now that feels like I've done a disservice to you guys by summing up two hours of the game in 30 seconds. But then again, this opening part kind of sucks and I know I was praising the atmosphere just a second ago but this game has the same problem fear one does with the level design there's just too much of one place for too long so while the whole facade of being in a hospital is great for the first 20 minutes it quickly starts to lose its charm when you realize you're not actually in a hospital because the next question is where am I but you don't get any of those answers until you spend another hour or so trudging through the not hospital this isn't going to be an exclusive first level level thing either by the way. If you go into a building during the campaign, you better be prepared to spend a hot minute in there because while this game does do level design better, it doesn't mean there's any less level than there was in the last game. Anyway, making it to the surface we find ourselves in a warehouse and with our objective still set to link up with our squad, we begin trying to leave. Heading out into the street, we can see the full extent of the damage caused by the Origin explosion. Buildings are in ruin. The streets are a mess. There are ash sculptures all through the street of what used to be people, immortalized in their panic at the moment of the explosion. In a flash, the story of fear has turned from a couple of gunfights in dark, abandoned alleys to a full-on apocalypse. And personally, I love it. The city streets in Fear 2 take on an atmosphere wholly different from the original. While Fear one was about cold dread and loneliness, Fear 2 has a sense of despair while also projecting a completely different sense of loneliness. The ambience is just impeccable. Heading to link up with our team, Alma reawakens the replica soldiers that went dormant after Paxton was killed. And if you think replicas are the only enemies that are introduced here, you are wrong. There are so many enemies introduced during this street sequence that I think it might be time for...
So like in Field 1, there are kind of two types of enemies in the game. Humans, except each type has something slightly different about their gameplay, and unique enemies, which do stuff like not shoot you with a gun. Humans, you get the general idea about them. Flamethrower guy has a flamethrower, sniper guy has a sniper, and when he's aiming, there's a laser pointer that you can see. Heavy armored guy has a lot of health. You get the idea, and they are boring. I don't want to talk about them today. What I really want to talk about is the unique enemies, because Fear 2 introduces quite a few of them, and they are way more interesting than the first game. So the first things first is that the game introduces the Rev-6's older brother called the EPA or Elite Powered Armor. It's bigger, it's tougher, and it fires explosive shells and rockets, but ironically it's easier to fight than the Rev-6 since you can just go rat mode if one of these things shows up and hide in a little crevice while grenade spamming the thing. The Abomination is a new addition to the ranks which you run into in the hospital level. In the lore these guys are failed experiments who were meant to become psychic commanders like Pax but were driven insane by the procedure and while these guys are scary they're kind of like the assassin from fear one where they just run up to you and try to thwack you so the solution to this problem is simply activating slow motion and shooting them although this isn't much of a complaint because abominations mostly attack in groups the specter is the leftover psychic signature of civilians caught in the origin explosion and all they really do is hang around until the player gets too close at which point they'll attack by running at the player and exploding shooting these guys even once will shut them down but they're kind of like the abomination where they mostly show up in packs. Finally we have my absolute favorite new enemy which is the remnant. These are people who didn't die to the origin explosion but were mutated by Alma's psychic influence afterwards and because of this they've become almost zombie like. Every time you run into a remnant they're imitating what they would be doing in their everyday life before the explosion. Once triggered a remnant will run around the map reviving corpses that will attempt to kill you and while this is cool the major strategy for beating these guys is to ignore the revived enemies and just hard focus the remnant itself. This is because most of the time once it's activated it will just hide in a corner letting its little minions do the work but if you find it you can just unload all your bullets into it and its only defense is pretty much screaming at you. Oh yeah and you know how I complained in the Fear 1 retrospective about how some of the coolest enemies in the game were also some of the least encountered? Well they didn't learn their lesson here because remnants the saddest, the scariest and downright most intriguing enemies in the game. Hell in the series show up a grand total of three times. Three times in the entire game. Why did you make the enemy? <laughs> it just baffles me that they wasted such a good enemy. I don't understand. But yeah, those are the new additions to the enemy roster, and I don't really have an issue with any of them. I always felt that in Fear 1, there weren't enough paranormal enemies for such a paranormally focused game, which Fear 2 fixes to some degree. Many of the enemies from the last game, like Replica Heavies or Assassins or Rev 6s are here too, but they're given a bit more of a backseat when talking about special enemies. Since this game kind of moves away from the the idea that a special enemy is just a guy with a lot of health. Anyway, so getting back on the story, we make our way through the city for a bit, fighting replicas until... Shit, I'm gonna come. Yep, Fear 2 has mech combat, and sadly, there isn't a whole lot to say about it. There's two mech sequences in the game, and most of what it boils down to is stomp around, shoot, fire rockets, and pretend you're playing Titanfall 3. Violet. Occasionally, an enemy mech will show up to fight you, but there's not much nuance here. It just comes down to who can output more damage quicker. Really, I felt a little mixed on this element when I first played, because I felt the gameplay addition was moving away from what I thought Fear was meant to be about, which was scurrying around alleyways desperately trying to survive against all odds, but these days I've kind of come around on it. Fear 2 is an action horror game with an emphasis on action coming first, but that doesn't mean it leaves horror twisting in the wind. When horror sequences come up, you're essentially helpless. When action sequences come up, you're challenged, and when mech or turret sequences come up, you're given free reign to let loose a little, so overall it balances itself out. But no matter what I say, at the end of the day I'm just overanalyzing what is just a wicked mech scene. <laughs> So after shooting our way through the city, we finally start getting close to our squad mates, but over the radio we hear our team leader start talking about seeing a crying woman, and making our way to our location, we see he's had the misfortune of running into Alma.
heading inside to assist, we make it just a bit too late. I saw her at the end of the hall. Your know fun fact? Kira Stokes, the comms operator on our squad, was voiced by Jen Taylor, who has probably shown up in a lot of games you've played. She played Cortana in Halo, Toad in Luigi's Mansion, and Zoe in Left 4 Dead. But the reason I'm telling you this is because the voice actor slash mocap actor and face actor for Alma in this game, Alicia Glidewell, was the original face for Zoe in the early days of Left 4 Dead. And get this, she's also the model that Valve used to build Chell's appearance in the Portal series. So yeah, small world, there are a lot of voice actors in Fear 2 that were active in the early 2000s that you might recognize, and Jen Taylor is just one of them. I mean, even the guy that voices Keegan just happens to have voiced male citizens from Half-Life 2, and none other than the fucking sniper from TF2. Like, holy shit, John Patrick Lowry jumpscare. Lieutenant. Sometimes... I dream about cheese. Anyway, after witnessing the horrible demise of our boss, we meet up with the rest of our squad and head to Wade Elementary to meet up with the guy who's been contacting us on the radio. And I know I haven't really talked about the guy on the radio, so I'll give you a brief rundown. Pretty much, he calls himself Snake Fist, and as far as we know, he works for but is not fond of Genevieve R. Steed. Over the past few levels, he's been intermittently raiding us, giving us info, and what we've learned from him is that R. Steed hasn't been completely honest with us. Back in the hospital when we entered the TAC machine, our steed was increasing our psychic signature to the point that Alma would take notice and start coming after Beckett to quote, absorb him. This is part of our steed's plan to get the armor cam board of directors back on her side. By somehow using Beckett to capture Alma, she won't be seen as a scapegoat anymore, probably even guaranteeing her a higher place in the company. But Snakefist tells us in chunks that Genevieve's plan to capture Alma won't work, and he has an alternate one that we need to come see him to act out. So yeah, that's why we're going to Wade Elementary School. And if you think all that info seems a little bit big to be known at this point in the story, I completely agree. But that's just how the game is. It's short. And by this point, halfway through, only past the second area, you pretty much know everything. There's nothing really that's gonna blindside you. Well, not much. Our steed is in classic evil corporation fashion, backstabbing us for her own gain, and we don't want that to happen. That's pretty much it. From this part in the story, nothing majorly shifts the cards. The plot doesn't take an overly surprising twist. Our objective never changes. Everything we do in Fear 2 is to get Alma off our tail. That's it. And I've got a lot to say about how this hurts the overall experience, but we're gonna have to save that for later because we still do have a little bit more of this game to go through. <laughs> Arriving at Wade Elementary, there's a strange kind of peace in the air. The destruction and battle raging within the city is now behind us, and for the first time, we can see the sun. The low whistling of the wind mixed with the distant explosions almost gives off the feeling that you haven't escaped, but instead you're running and it's all coming after you. Heading inside the school, the atmosphere shifts a little bit. The peace and dread of the outside world is now gone, replaced with a foreboding silence. On some TVs, we can see that this school is completely controlled by armor care, and our objective is set to get to the nurse's office to meet Snake Fist. Just down the hallway. Many problems are easily resolved by taking a small trip to your friendly nurse station. Oh, there's a doctor now. Walking through the school with Kira, we go through a door and suddenly get pulled into a hallucination of Alma swinging on a tree. Coming to the door we've just gone through is gone and we've been separated from Stokes. Now going forward in the level, a ton of stuff happens. Replica forces begin showing up because they're drawn to our psychic signature. Armor cam also begins arriving and a huge fight ensues across the school. But let me put it out there that all of this stuff is irrelevant because of all the things that happens in Wade Elementary, the fighting is not the interesting part. If you ask anyone that's played Fear 2 what their favorite part is, a lot of them will say it's Wade Elementary because this is one of the best put together sequences of horror in the entire series. I'm on a whole nother 
alert and it all starts in this hallway. By the way, if you don't do well with flashing lights, I would suggest you skip this bit. This hallway is a masterclass of scripting. At a certain point, your light stops working properly. Spectres begin appearing from all sides, not allowing you time to focus on any one element. In the flashes of vision you get from the ceiling lights, we get bits of what's happening around us. Bodies stuck to the ceiling, Alma reaching out for us, a body dragged away, Alma again. So much is happening, so many things are coming for you. This is fight or flight and you don't know the enemy, so you need to run. Breaking through a door, Alma appears to us again, attacking us. Strangely, she seems almost hurt as we throw her off, and pinning us to the ceiling, Alma reveals her true intentions. She doesn't want to absorb Beckett as Snake Fist says, she wants Beckett. Now until this point in the game, we didn't know what Alma was after. According to Snake Fist, she wants to absorb Beckett's psychic signature. But if she really wanted to do that, she could have done it earlier. But instead, she's just kind of stalked us and defended us even at some points. This has kind of created a mystery of why she's coming after us. And the truth is, Alma wants her kids back. That is Alma's whole objective during this game. If you think about it this way, at the moment, Alma believes both her children are dead. Paxton was shot and left in the origin facility and Point Man was not present in the wreckage of the helicopter Alma downed at the end of the first game. In the hospital level of this game you can even see Alma searching the morgue for Point Man's body. During the same level we can hear Alma say, I want them back. And our squad mate they got discombobulated said that he thinks Alma is crying because Alma Cam took her babies away. From Alma's point of view, the only people in life that she didn't see as evil or trying to hurt her were her children. But the events of the first fear game once again took them away from her. So naturally once she became aware of Beckett, she began flirting with him. And if deprived of social contact your whole life, I'm pretty sure that you would consider flirting to be literally attacking the other person as well. I'm good. I'm good. So continuing through the school, we're continuously stalked by Alma, and every time we're not fighting, we're running through haunted house sections. But eventually we make it to the nurse's office, which turns out to be less an office and more an elevator to an underground facility. And this is the headquarters of Armacam's Project Harbinger. Essentially, Project Harbinger is an attempt to create psychic commanders like Paxton Fettel without having to breed them from existing psychics. The way this is done is by setting up literally an entire school and experimenting on the students. These students from the get-go are gifted according to some in-game documents and they are separated into three categories. Bluebirds, ladybugs and tree frogs. Bluebirds are the most simple group to be in. The students are given placebo supplements and told it will make them smarter or something like that and they are observed over their time at the school to see if psychic abilities will develop by themselves. Note, they didn't. Ladybugs are given a mutagen called PN5A, which is the most effective in developing psychic abilities, however they are hard to control. And finally, tree frogs are given a mutagen called PN5B, which supports the development of psychic abilities with more stability, but doesn't develop psychic powers so noticeably. And that's pretty much the whole project. Armor Cam desperately wants to find a way to get another Paxton Fettel in a more controlled environment, and it turns out they've been pursuing this for quite some time. Because get this, all of the members of Beckett's squad except Stokes underwent this program at this school when they were kids. They just have no memory of it. That's why Genevieve Aristide wanted Dark Signal specifically to come get her. Because while they may not have developed the ability to control replicas, they would make great bait for Alma Wade who could sense their psychic signatures. So that is the long and short of what the school and the facility is about. And honestly, I don't know if I've just been desensitized to armor cam plots at this point, but Harvey Harbinger doesn't feel like the massive deal it's made out to be in the game. We know Armor Cam is bad news. We know they have no problem experimenting on kids. So discovering everything about Harbinger doesn't change anything in the story. It just adds context to what's already happened, making it kind of feel like, so what's the big fucking deal? But anyway, we aren't actually at Wade Elementary for Harbinger. We're here for Snake Fist. So continuing through the facility, we run into Colonel Vanek and have the most epic boss fight in any fear game ever with 
with him. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering why I didn't really touch on Colonel Vanek, it's because he's not really important. Every couple of levels, he just shows up and he's like, I want Beckett killed, and that's it. He's just here to say funny drill instructor things. Anyway, after vacating the vicinity of Vanek, we finally make it to Snake Fist's hideout. You made it! Man, I thought I was toast! I'm Terry. Terry Halford, a.k.a. Snake Fist. Terry doesn't really tell us that much when we meet him. All we really get is that we need to go to Still Island, an armor camp facility the company used to imprison Alma before the Origin facility was in use. And other than that, he gives us an energy weapon and... Now, let's get the hell out of here. You know, I don't ever think I've played a game where a character is built up as much as Snake Fist is, only for that character to just be killed instantly. This game's writing is so strange. But if we do get anything from this little trip, it's a cool energy launcher, which is unbelievably OP. When you shoot this thing, it fires out a glowing blue orb that turns anyone near it into a skeleton. And if the enemy doesn't have a skeleton, it will do a ton of damage to them. And if that's not enough, the ball then explodes. This thing is literally just the BFG from Doom. If you want a room clear, just fire one of these off. So shooting our way out of the school and linking back up with our squad, we go and look through Terry's data where he explains his plan. Both Genevieve and Snake Fist want Beckett to go to Steel Island and sit in a machine called the Telesthetic Amplifier. But while Genevieve wants to trap Alma inside while using Beckett as bait, Snake Fist wants to turn on the amplifier. This would crank up Beckett's psychic ability to the point where he could beat Alma in a battle of wills. So with our objective set, we begin heading to Steel Island, but the transport is ambushed by replicas on the Away. and during the defense sequence Keegan is seemingly hypnotized by Alma and runs away. Being tasked with bringing him back we're sent after him and everybody I would love to welcome you to the part of the video where my already loose story breakdown breaks down fully because this is where my problems with this game become unignorable. They become so unbelievably blatant I just have to whine about them for the rest of the video my major number one problem with this game is that it is six hours long it is a short game in all regards and yet it is boring as fuck every area in the six hours is stretched to its absolute limit of how little story can happen in the longest amount of time granted a lot of the fear series is guilty of doing this they say here's an objective go do it but they'd never tell you that this objective may or may not take you two hours there's a point you reach during your objectives where you begin to wonder if you're done with a section every single time and there's no better example of this than when we're sent after keegan the stage is set here for the final showdown. We know where we need to go. Many of the supporting characters are dead, but for some reason the game decides we need an hour of chasing Keegan. Just while we're on this objective alone, we have to fight our way through the subway, through the streets in a mech, through an armor cam facility, on an armor cam train, through an armor cam train station, and eventually we just give up on trying to find Keegan and end up going to Still Island. This fucking sucks because there are so many cool set pieces and things you can find while you're going after Keegan. Like in the subways, we get a laser gun. In the streets, we get to see the crater that the origin facility explosion caused. Or there's a moment where Alma constantly attacks you from multiple angles. It's all great stuff, but the overarching story does not support the little things like this. You don't feel like you're getting in 90% of your fights for any particular reason other than the fact that the game needs to give you something to do. It just feels like the game isn't trying to engage the player. It's not trying to offer you an experience. It's not trying to take you on a ride is trying to stop you from completing it too soon it's like here's an objective here's where you are here's seven different fights player it's almost like the game is obligated to exist so they're like okay here's a baseline story and then just 
uh, make them fight like a million people on the way there while we just drag our heels. <laughs> but I digress, we're gonna leave this rant for the end of the video, because if you can believe it or not, the final 20 minutes only adds more fuel to my fire. Anyway, reaching Still Island, we can find Alma's tree. This is the tree that we have seen in every hallucination with Alma. And every time it's been seen, it's been on a grassy hill in the open. But here we find that this is where Alma was allowed to be outside during her captivity. Also, I know it is jarring for me to go from complaining to praising this game, but this exact area, this moment in the game, is one of the only parts that actually makes me feel something. This tree represented freedom to Alma. That's why we've always seen it on a hill. Her most free, her most fond memories come from a tree swing that looks like it's a part of a zoo enclosure. To me, this drives home the tragedy of Alma's story. A girl with extraordinary powers is betrayed by her father and robbed of her childhood and life in every way. And out of all of it, this is the place she is most fond of a dead tree in a muddy enclosure. Sometimes Fear 2 channels the emotions that the original game radiated. In Fear 1, every bit of the mystery you uncovered was not pleasant. Every scrap you pieced together added to the ambience, the cold sadness that saturated the game. Sometimes Fear 2 remembers what it is, where it came from, the story. It remembers how to do that ambience well, but it just, there's something missing. Making our way through the facility, we eventually meet up with Stokes and entering the amplifier chamber, we go about setting up the solution to all our problems. Once that's done, Kira straps us into the chair when we're suddenly ambushed by an old face. Arsted? What's wrong with you? We have to stop Alma. That's exactly what I intend to do. But Beckett's not strong enough without the amplifier. She'll absorb him. And then we'll lock them away. What the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you doing this? Without Alma, I don't have any leverage. Without leverage, I don't have a future. I can't believe this. The city's a smoldering ruin and you're worried about your fucking resume. Listen. No, you listen. We're doing this Halford's way. We're gonna kill this bitch. Oh man, the writing in this game is so good. Holy shit. By the way, guys, who would win? A corporate executive with a gun or a special forces soldier with a gun? I'm sorry it came to this. I think I know about 10 people in real life who aren't special forces soldiers who would probably have handled that a little bit better than Stokes just did. Like, what the fuck? Genevieve already turned off the amplifier and had the gun out. So why would you even try to negotiate with her? And if you're in the mindset of not negotiating, why are you letting her keep the gun? Genevieve barely had time to raise the gun at Stokes when she loudly announced that she was going to kill Aristide and Stokes' back was turned. That means that Soaks could have 100% either shot or disarmed Genevieve at least here, here, and here. At least. Keyword, at least. You wouldn't even have to do anything fancy. She is limping. Like, just push her off the platform. I don't know how anyone wrote this scene or, or looked at it or acted it out and was like, no, yeah, that's not contrived at all. Anyway, because the plot demands it, Genevieve seals Beckett in the vault with Alma and she begins to assault Beckett while also forcing his his mind into a hallucination. During this scene, we have to reactivate the amplifier, which I don't really know what that would do if we're in a hallucination, but whatever. And each time we throw a switch, Keegan shows up with a bunch of clones to try kill us since he's become fully converted by Alma. But yeah, really, there's not much to this fight. You just run around the map, uh, kill Keegan's and, and throw the switches and yeah, that's it. <laughs>
So yeah, that is Fear 2. And there's not much to say about this game other than it is confused. To put it in the most simple terms, Fear 2 wants to be Fear 2, but it doesn't know what made Fear 1 Fear 1. It improves on the design of the original in quite a few categories. Level design is back on the menu with locations actually being places rather than them being a general concept of the area the player is in. There's a lot of good scares in the game and oops, I've run out of good things to say about Fear 2 because if there is one thing Fear 2 is, it is the worst thing you can be if you're an artistic piece of media, and that is mediocre. The story is quite literally one note. Alma starts stalking you and your job is to get her to stop. That's what you try to do at the end of the game, but you fail and the game ends on a cliffhanger, but a cliffhanger for what? Harlan warns that if Alma gets out, it will be catastrophic in the first game, and yet everything that happens in Fear 2 is pretty much everyone else's fault. Point Man made the origin facility detonate. Aristide was the one that made you bait for Alma. The replicas are only coming after you because of the insane psychic reading you're giving off. Alma isn't really doing anything here and now it's the end of the game, she's pregnant and you want me to care? What, why? Despite what it looks like, there is no payoff from Fear 1 in Fear 2. Alma's story does not progress until the end, and considering that she is one of the only continuing story elements brought over from Fear 1, means that the entire story as a whole does not progress. That is something you cannot have if you are a sequel. I have a little example I like to use when thinking about this game. It is like you're craving a burger, right? You've been craving one all week and you finally have one. This burger you're eating is the tastiest, most delicious burger, most fulfilling thing in the world. You're eating this thing and you're like, yeah, this is what I wanted. But then you finish eating it and you've realized it has not satisfied your hunger at all. That is what Fear 2 is. You feel like you're getting more fear while you're playing Fear 2, but once you're done, you realize you can't pull out a single discernible thing that made it a good fear game. To be completely blunt, this whole experience feels like filler. It feels like a side story while the main campaign is going on somewhere else, and based on how Fear 2 is referenced and treated in Fear 3, it's not far off the truth. Even the main campaign feels Feels like it's made of filler, like they didn't have enough story to go around, so they had to stretch each area out as far as they could manage. The entire experience just mostly ends up feeling like there's not a whole lot going on here. In fact, you guys are going to love this. One of the biggest overarching story drivers in Fear 2 is not even a part of the main campaign. It's a DLC called Fear 2 Reborn. This is Fox In Reborn, you play as a replica soldier named Foxtrot 813, who is possessed by the spirit of Paxton Fettel and guided towards reviving him. But there's a problem here. I can't really talk about this DLC because it's got the same problems as the main game. It is full of filler. All that happens during this DLC is that you get possessed and now you have to fight your way to the origin crater to revive Paxton. There's nothing new to talk about with the DLC except for Alma apparently not wanting wanting Paxton to be reborn. Through the campaign, she tries to kill 813 multiple times, and even Paxton shit talks Alma a little bit during the levels. They do not understand. They are blind. But none of this feels legit. Paxton is constantly yapping on about, finally, it's time to be reborn. Dude, you've been dead technically half a day. Like, doesn't anybody else see this? The DLC comes to an end with Paxton transferring his consciousness into Foxtrot 813. And you would be forgiven for believing that this sets up the next chapter of Paxton's story in the series as a whole. I am reborn. But I hate to inform you that Fear 3 completely ignores this DLC. Paxton is revived in Fear 3, but it is not explained, and the actual piece of media that shows him being revived is ignored. What, what is wrong with this series, guys? Finally, for this retrospective, there is multiplayer, and this section will be short. Pretty much, this is your average early 2000s multiplayer mode. There's deathmatch, capture the flag, that's about it. It does improve some things over the original feel, like these maps are actually now interesting to look at. And there's also a new game mode where you get to play mech vs mech.
heart. So yeah, no complaints about the multiplayer, pretty good, although Monolith, please nerf the energy rifle. Holy Bringing this all to a close, I will say that Fear 2 is my biggest contender for forgettable Game of the Year award every year. Fear 3 might be bad, but at least I remember it for the reasons I don't like it. Fear 1 might not be perfect, but at least I remember it for the way it makes me feel. But Fear 2 makes me feel nothing. It's forgettable. It's strangely safe feeling considering the things it does in the campaign. It just doesn't fill the combat boots of the previous game. To make a comparison, this is what it would feel like to play Half-Life 2 if Half-Life 2 was Blue Shift. Like it's a major entry in the series and yet somehow it feels like a sidestep into a smaller scale story. Overall, there's just not much to say. Fear 2 is just mediocre. It's not bad, it's not good, it's just in the sweet spot of being okay. And don't get me wrong, games are allowed to be okay, but the problem with this one is that it just happened to be an okay sequel to one of the best shooters of the early 2000s. And that's why I'm giving this game and its DLC the rating it deserves. A middle of the road, just okay, downright average, 5 out of 10. Welcome to the Vivendi timeline, and you might be thinking, timelines? There's other timelines? Well, yeah, believe it or not, Fear 2 was not the first continuation of the Fear story. That honor goes to the two expansions by Timegate Studios made for Fear 1, named Extraction Point and Perseus Mandate. Are you the hunter or the prey? The war is coming. Fear. Extraction Point follows Point Man directly after the first game when his chopper is downed, and we spend the entire game getting to, well, an extraction point. Perseus Mandate, on the other hand, follows a secondary fear team as they drop into Fairport to try gather intel on what Armor Cam is up to. Now, both of these expansions sound like they have pretty simple plots, but they actually expand upon the lore in big ways. So big, in fact, that Monolith began feeling like the expansions were pointing the lore in a direction that they didn't want and weren't going in for Fear 2. So just like that, they said, Perseus Mandate and Extraction Point are not canon and should be considered a what-if scenario. This is where the Vivendi timeline comes in. With the rights issues that the Fear IP was going through in the mid-2000s, both Monolith and Vivendi did the very mature thing and started a little fear-based pissing contest. Fear 1 would be canon in both of these companies' timelines, but the context surrounding Fear 1 would be drastically different based on what story continuation you went with. And by that same token, the direction of the series was also radically different. So Extraction Point picks up where Fear 1 left off. We wake up in a crashed helicopter and now without any mission, enemies to fight or directions from command, we've got one goal and that is to leave. Heading out of the hotel, the first thing you'll notice about Extraction Point is that Fear 1 ambience. is back in this game, but it's also different. Something that's absolutely genius in this expansion is the decision to make the city abandoned. It's not just you're in places that people don't go anymore, it's that after the origin explosion, a massive chunk of Fairport's population just vanished. The city is empty. Must have been a radioactive element to the origin explosion and the city was evacuated. Cities don't empty this quick. You get this super eerie feeling in the streets because this isn't a case of life going on while all this weird stuff is happening to just you anymore. The weird stuff happening to you is now over, but coming up to the real world for a breath of fresh air, you find that there is no real world anymore. That fear one loneliness has now escaped to those back alleys and is now everywhere. It's just another example of fear doing ambience well. And not just that, it's fear doing ambience well, plus in a different way every time. 
time. This isn't crushing loneliness anymore. This is inescapable loneliness. So getting down to the actual plot, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what Extraction Point is about. The story is on the thinner side here, and mostly you're trying to get to the Extraction Point in Auburn Hospital, and through the levels you come into contact with different NPCs that either add pieces to the puzzle on what's going on in the city, or to help you out. Oh yeah, Norton Mapes shows up here as well, because he was just such a funny and interesting character in the first game. Listen, you owe me. You wouldn't have gotten out of Origin without me. You know that, right? You wait right there. I'll come around and open the door. Never mind he got shot and left in a facility that exploded. Never mind that we don't even have the original voice actor for this guy. Bring him back. I want him in the game again. What am I, an IS lackey? You wouldn't have gotten out of Origin without me. Acting. But yeah, in good fear fashion, nothing really happens in this game until, well, the end of the game. But there are some good moments in the brunt of it. Paxton Fettel is revived because, you know, what would a fear game be if Paxton Fettel didn't show up in it? I just feel like it would be incomplete. He carries the whole series. You killed me. I died. <laughs> Holiday gets killed in the most brutal death I think I've ever seen in a game. Jin speed runs the game and gets to the extraction point first and slowly gets more and more depressed that point men won't talk to her through the game. You're not coming, are you? I'm going to die here alone. I don't want to die with them. There's also a weird rivalry established between young Alma and old Alma. I'm not joking, young Alma actually helps Point Man out quite a bit during Extraction Point and doesn't seem to be trying to hurt us unlike in the main game. Old Alma, or the actual like physical body that escaped the Project Origin facility however, seems to have a bone to pick with us since near the end we're pulled into a kind of prison by her. This prison has everyone who's ever hurt her locked away and we find that Alma is planning to do the same to Point Man for rejecting her at the end of the first game. But before anything bad can happen, some stuff that I don't really understand happens and both young and old Alma merge into one being. And look, I know that a lot of you guys look to me when it comes to lore stuff, but I don't know what's going on here, man. Every single source I find that is like, young Alma and old Alma merge. What does that mean, bro? <laughs> Some people tell me it was meant to be the kind of end of her, her story arc where she's accepting to move on from her pain. Uh, others say that uh, it, it's the next chapter of her story, but I'll be honest, I just, I don't know. It doesn't make much sense. And I think it was just setting up for whatever extraction point was gonna do after that in the other fear too. Anyway, so the DLC ends when we get to the extraction point and the helicopter that's gonna pick us up gets destroyed by Paxton, leaving Point Man's fate on a cliffhanger that will be resolved in the next game. Right? Gameplay wise, Extraction Point is largely the same as Fear 1, but the biggest difference here is the level design. Somehow the expansion does what Fear 1 and Fear 2 couldn't. It makes levels easier to navigate while retaining the capabilities of the AI. It's actually weird to play through. For once, the Fear experience is somehow well rounded, instead of one feature being crap for the sake of another feature being better. And this is an expansion that wasn't made by Monolith, by the way. <laughs> Oh, and while on the topic of enemies, there are some new ones to be found here. The Rev-6 now has an older cousin called the Rev-8 Leviathan, and it pretty much does the same thing the Rev-6 does, it's just a little bit beefier. Although I do find it funny that both Fear 2 and the other Fear continuation tries to introduce the Rev-6, but just bigger. On the replica side of things, there's only one new enemy, with that being the Heavy Riot Armor, which is just a heavy armored replica with a minigun. Finally, we have the Shade, and this thing is just, well, I don't know what to say about it. It spends most of its time being invisible and is pretty much just a replica assassin, but paranormal. Although this is a series first, this is a meta enemy because it has the ability to lag the fuck out of your game. Like, holy shit. I don't even want to go in here, bro. Oh. Oh, die. I can't even see him. I gotta let's go. We gotta run away. Get away from me. <laughs> no. 
Oh, come on. <laughs> Over in weapons, there's also some new additions, most notably the laser and minigun. Honestly, I'm not really a person that enjoys plotting down the specifics of weapons in games, so I'll just say that I love these things. The addition of these two weapons are fantastic for the Fear series. Like, they're just, how do I explain it? They're so much fun. <laughs> Moving into lore differences, this is pretty expansive. The first thing you'll notice when comparing Fear 2 to EP in terms of being a continuation are how important the Origin Facility explosion is to the overall story. In Fear 2, the facility blowing up is honestly one of the reasons the game drags so much. Fear 2 is obsessed with running around a nuked city, running around in the consequences of the last five minutes of Fear 1. It is so obsessed that it forgets to move forward. Here in EP, though it's quite the opposite a literal nuclear explosion goes off in fairport and it's nearly completely ignored now a couple of years ago when i first played this i was thinking man this is stupid i want to know what happened with the explosion i vastly preferred fear 2's version but somehow playing this again extraction point takes my opinions from back then and it makes it an asset after the explosion the city isn't in ruins it's not in a state of emergency in fact everywhere you go everything seems fine it looks like everyone just dropped what they were doing and left but that's not possible a few hours can't just pass and everyone suddenly leaves the city it just doesn't make any sense and that's what creates that perfect atmosphere i was talking about early in fear 2 the origin explosion sends out a wave of paranormal activity which is something i really love in the game but here it multiplies that fact a nuclear explosion goes off in a city and instead of a bang it's dead silence. It is eerie and it is fantastic. Another thing that's different is Armor Cam's role in the story. In Monolith's timeline, Armor Cam goes full on cleanup mode trying to distance themselves from their mess by deploying their entire private army into Fairport and shooting everything. While I like Armor Cam as an evil corporation, there's just always been a part of me that thinks that it doesn't fit the comically evil video game corporation archetype. I mean, why would a corporation like Armor Cam that only cares about their bottom line spend a billion dollars trying to clean up this mess. Even in Fear 1, which is canon to Monolith's timeline, it's hinted that Armor Cam has friends in the US government, like you can hear Genevieve RSD talking to a US senator in the first game. We can still resolve this discreetly, but we have to move fast. Oh, alright, alright, let me... Make a few calls. It feels way more natural in this game that shit just goes sideways for ATC and they just disappear without a word as opposed to literally becoming the Umbrella Corporation. <laughs> Chickpea. Overall, the story is the weakest part of Extraction Point, but I don't really mind since it's like, what can you really get out of a DLC called Extraction Point where you're trying to get to an Extraction Point? The horror in this one is better, the levels are better, everything is just better. Somehow, this DLC learned all the right lessons from the base game and put them all into this. It just feels like fear in a more perfected form. So putting this all together, I'll say pretty great. Extraction Point is on the level of the OG and it's probably better but it's only pulled back by its less interesting story so I'm gonna give it an 8 out of 10. Perseus Mandate was the second and final DLC for Fear and it goes out with a bit of a whimper in my opinion. In Perseus Mandate you play as the Sergeant and yes that is his name. The Sergeant is a part of a Fear team that is sent into Fairport about halfway through Fear 1 and our goal is to figure out exactly what armor cam is hiding since by this point ATC security forces has started attacking fear at the actual headquarters and i want to say i'm not a huge fan of this one based on mostly the fact that it doesn't feel very uh theory like you think i'm joking but the scary part of this dlc isn't alma wade it's the u.s government <laughs> Pretty much through the campaign, you come into conflict with some mercenaries called the Nightcrawlers, and they're here looking for, um, 
Well, it's not really made clear. They want a project called Perseus, but by the end of the game, I wasn't really even sure what they still wanted. The long and short of it is there's a US senator that wants something called Perseus. And he got this other guy named Gavin Morrison to hire the Nightcrawlers in order to get Perseus. And at the end of the game, it's revealed that they really want a sample of Alma and Paxton's DNA. Why? Well, I don't know. Either because I'm a too stupid or because that is something that we're setting up for the next game. But I, I, I still don't know. Look, my best guess is they probably wanted Psychic Commanders because that is all this game series really cares about, isn't it? I think I don't have a super high opinion of this expansion because it's not the complete package. It tries to set up a big story and conspiracy, but the stuff it's trying to build up just isn't interesting. It's not scary. In fact, the scary stuff in this game has been toned all the way down. The atmosphere just isn't there. That cold loneliness is gone. The gameplay once again remains largely the same, but also still keeps the new design strategy of Extraction Point. A lot of Extraction Point's weapons and enemies return in Perseus Mandate, but there are also a few new additions in both categories. For weapons, there's a new electrical gun, a new silenced machine gun, a grenade launcher, no complaints. I love all of these. They're great. On the enemy side, you have the new Nightcrawler enemies, which mostly behave like reskinned replicas, but there are some actual interesting types among their ranks, like the Nightcrawler Elite. These guys are annoyingly fast, even in slow-mo, and if I were to draw a comparison, I'd say that they the spiritual successes to Half-Life's assassins. <laughs> There's also one new monster called the Scarecrow, which hides in these black rifts that open on the floors. And I actually really like these guys because they feel kind of unique as opposed to every other paranormal enemy that's just a big gray blob. But still, I am convinced that the absolute scariest thing about these guys is how fucking loud their death sound is. Holy shit. <laughs> When it comes to the differences between the Vivendi and Monolith timeline, it mostly comes down to how deep the secrets go with Project Origin. All up, the Monolith timeline does a good job at keeping things tidy. Project Origin was a thing and now it's over and that game realizes that. Any info you get in Fear 2 that adds context to Fear 1 makes you kind of go like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But here, I feel like it goes just one step too far. They say stuff like, here's where Paxton grew up. Plus, did you know that Armor Cam has a sample of Alma and Paxton's DNA? Did you know that Armacam has another secret underground facility related to Project Origin? The game asks me to give a shit about these elements they introduced. Like they say, look at this thing we've made up, it's related to a thing you already know about, and now the bad guys have got it. Are you excited? No. I don't care about psychic powers or, or psychic genes splicing or anything. That's not what I'm here for. If I was a player playing this back in the day, I'd be thinking, what does this have to do with the scary ghost girl? <laughs> it's not bad at all. It just feels not very fear-like. Boiling it all down, this all feels very inconsistent to me. It's like they had a kind of balancing act they were attempting, but failed. They wanted to go in a direction of government conspiracies and espionage, but they also tried to balance it with scary stuff. You know, what the series is about. So it's just really strange feeling. You have moments like the part where you're stuck underground in an old part of the city, where the horror is at its best in the series, but then there's just five hours of dollar store Tom Clancy plots surrounding that stuff. Also, why does the sergeant have point man powers? At least Beckett went through an operation to get him in Fear 2. C come on, man. Anyways, not a huge fan of this one, but it's not a bad time, so I'll give it 6 out of 10. So yeah, those were the Vivendi timeline Fear expansions. In some aspects, it's tragic that these never went anywhere. Taking a wide view of the series, I think the story would have been better off if they they followed whatever these two packs were trying to set up. It all feels more focused, more flowing, put together with more intent, rather than just time to play. But honestly, that's the way the cookie crumbles. These expansions serve as a taste of what could have been, and if not sad, I'll say I find it interesting. These packs are the clearest example of what happens when creative vision is fractured between studios, when money gets in the way of creativity. But yeah, that's all I really have to say about these things, except Monolith, please 
please start respecting your legacy a little more. Half the loading screens in these DLCs will crash the game if you're running on high settings. Every 2000s monolith game has a frame rate problem requiring a third party patch to fix. Oh guys, the game doesn't want to meet Norton Mapes either. It just crashed. Why does the stream feel like it's 30 or 45 FPS? Because it is. <laughs> Dude, I don't know why. It, this game is like not going well. I think we've just crashed again, guys. How many intervals are in this one? It's like, oh no. I think it just crashed, guys. Has the game just finally given up? Holy crap. I think I gotta, I think I gotta restart the game, guys. Oh, did it change the resolution again? Oh, I hate this game. <laughs> if anything, you are scaring people away from experiencing your products. Products that were pretty influential on the industry back in the day. And it's all because you guys didn't future-proof your games and won't support them in modern day. Which, I don't know, man. I think you need to do better. And I think that it's a little bit disappointing. Just like... What the fuck is this piece of shit? Fear 3 has a place close to my heart, and it's not because I like it, it's because this is one of the first times I was genuinely disappointed by a game. Now long time viewers will know the story, Baby Brandos had a terrible laptop as a kid slash teenager that forced him to play nothing but old games. We're talking Half-Life, Bioshock, Stalker, every prolific series I could get to run and get my hands on. It was an exciting time for me and it shaped me into who I am today. I still remember counting down the days till the seam sale so I could get that bundle of famous old games. I'd heard of these things, I'd heard of how they'd shaped the landscape of gaming today, so every new game felt like I was experiencing history. Then along came fear. In 2019, I got all the games, and booting them up, well, you've seen the other videos, right? Right. Come Fear 3 though, I wasn't ready for what I experienced. Up until that point, I had enjoyed the series as a whole. I had immersed myself in the lore and jumping into Fear 3 was like a cold bucket of water. This game felt like the writer read the story of the other games with his eyes closed. This game felt like I could sue it for false advertising with how unscary it was. This game felt like every game I had played in the last few years and somehow felt nothing like Fear. But for those who don't know, pretty much Fear 3 is a co-op FPS horror where you play as either Paxton Fettle or Point Man. It takes place nine months after Fear 1 and the story is that Paxton and Point Man are trying to find Alma. I guess I don't really know. They spend a lot of this game just running around in places. I mean what else can you say in a summary? Fear 3 is shockingly bare bones and this is thanks very much to the hellish development cycle that the game went through for about four four years straight. Now before we get into this, I do want to put out a little disclaimer because this is a weird kind of case where this is a really bad game, but the developers were equally kind of fucked in this situation. I want to make it very clear that I'm a fan of the Fear series and I am speaking from a place of disappointment. None of what I'm about to say in this video is directed at the developers because I know how much the developers were the real victims here. You know, a bigger victim than Baby Brandos playing the third video game that in a series he bought and going like, oh, this isn't what I wanted. Ah. So please just understand where I'm coming from, from a place of criticism in this video and who I'm directing at. It's not the developers. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk development because this one is fascinating. Not only for how downright horrible it all was, but how consistently it keeps with the fear quality scale. See, Fear 1 was a pretty good game with all round not that many development issues. Fear 2 was a pretty okay game with some development issues. Fear 3 is a pretty bad game with development issues that make Cold War geopolitics look like a minor disagreement. Okay, that's a minor overstatement, but I mean seriously minor. To set the stage, remember when I was talking about Fear 2 and I said this. While Monolith was developing Fear 2, Vivendi was developing their own version of Fear 2 as well, but I won't be talking about that because this Fear 2 morphed into Fear 3, which we'll talk about this time. So yeah, Fear 2 started life at Vivendi in 2006, around 
around the time that all the rights issues began kicking off. Monolith had access to Fear's story, its characters, its locations. Vivendi had the name and the in-universe organization. So with these two admittedly major feathers in their cap, they went to a game developer called Day One Studios and told them to make them a Fear sequel. Now you guys are gonna love this. Vivendi chose Day One Studios for this project because they had ported Fear One to the PS3 and Xbox 360 in 2006. And yes, these were the ports that were so bad, it made Monolith attempt to develop three separate versions of Fear 2 on their side of the fence. It's like development problems inception. <laughs> if you think about it, not having access to the first game's story or characters or anything actually gave them a lot of freedom. They didn't have to follow up with a plot line they didn't write. All they had to do was make their Fear 2. So getting to work, they came up with an outline. And just before we get into this, I want to thank YouTuber Dead Domain for their awesome work on their criminally underrated Fear 3 documentary, where they interview developers about the behind the scenes of Fear 3. I mean, just going on the Fear 3 Wikipedia page, a huge part of the development section is sourced from this video. We would not know a majority of the things that went on at day one during development without their video. So huge props to them. There's a link in the description for anyone who wants more Fear 3 content after this and wants to watch content from someone who is considerably more professional than me. Anyway, the Vivendi Fear 2 was about phasing technology. There's not a lot of info out there, but essentially the technology to open rifts was somehow misused, with the result being a massive portal is opened to a supernatural world called the World Behind the Walls. To shut it down, a fear team would be deployed, and that's the premise. And yeah, that sounds pretty sweet. I'd love to play- Oh no, guys, it's- it's Warner Bros. Yep, this was the fateful day. In September of 2008, Warner Bros purchased the rights to Fear back, making anything that was Fear related at the time theirs, including in development Fear games like our Vivendi Fear 2. Now, Warner Bros looked at Fear 2 version 2 and said, hey, we already have a real Fear 2 in development, but do you know what we don't have? Fear 3? Fear 3, yes, make it happen. And just like that, 18 months of work on Fear 2 was gone, but this was just the beginning of the micromanaging Day One Studios had to endure. Fear 3 was now going to have to continue from the cliffhanger that Fear 2 left, and while Day One Studios wanted Brian Keane, a well-established horror author, to write the script, Warner Bros instead hired Steve Niles, who specialized in horror, but mostly for comic books. Now around this time, Steve was on a project with none other than John Carpenter, and yes, that John Carpenter, director of such obscure indie films such as Halloween, Dark Star, the Thing. So Steve Niles pretty much asked WB if he could bring Carpenter on as a co-writer and WB said yes because who doesn't want John Carpenter's name on their horror game? But things from here on out weren't completely rosy. Niles first draft of the script was more similar to a movie screenplay and according to some day one employees not only did he send in new drafts late regularly but his material more often than not needed to be rewritten. None of this was helped by the fact that John Carpenter was reportedly playing playing the role of the ideas man, showing up to conference calls, giving inputs on story notes and cutscenes without much else. They had the mystical mind of John Carpenter on the project, and yet it seemed like he was just a name to put on the box. In other parts of the studio, things weren't great either. Initially being developed as a single player experience, Warner Bros began getting hands on, trying to shape the game into something that rode a lot of trends at the time. The first major change was the addition of co-op. Monolith encouraged a day want to explore the relationship between Point Man and Paxton Fettel. So adding him as a co-op partner, Day One had to retool multiple levels to make them compatible for two players. But the retooling didn't stop. Day One was continuously told to add in more set pieces, make the game more epic, make it more exciting. During this time, Day One was subject to insane crunch. We're talking 60 to 80 hour work weeks for around eight months. And let me remind you, this is crunch after three to four years years of development. So this continued on, many devs quit, the game was delayed a couple of times, and finally it was released in June of 2011. I mean, just what a story. This wasn't a situation like CD Projekt Red where they released Cyberpunk in a broken state and were able to get their rep back by fixing the thing. Fear 1 was put out 
and no one knew why I was so shit and they never got a chance to explain themselves. They got fucked so hard. And honestly, WB, this shit is embarrassing, dude. No wonder you don't want anyone to remember the Fear series. Holy crap. Just imagine pouring your passion into a project for nearly two years only for that to be taken away from you. And then as you begin work on the new project, you get told you're doing it wrong every step of the way by people who probably think that Tetris is still next gen. Yeah, so the development of Fear 3 is just insane. It's a miracle it got released at all and I want to once again state that I'm not trying to demean anyone's work that actually worked on Fear 3. My complaints, my jabs, these are all going towards the people who didn't do their research on what Fear is, who didn't trust the devs to do their job, who didn't respect the legacy of Fear and didn't even give a shit. So just know that this product I'm about to make fun of is not a passion project. This is a corporate product. It was made to ride the coattails of the trends of the early 2010s and it deserves everything it's got coming to it. I want you to take that in, and we are going in, so buckle up. So the game starts with, oh, wait a minute, the Fear 3 story doesn't start here, it starts with the tie-in prequel comic. Okay, so you know how in Fear 1 it ends with Alma climbing into the chopper, and then there was that DLC that explains what happens afterwards that got decanonized? Well, this prequel comic tells us what happened instead of Extraction Point. In the monolith timeline, Point Man's chopper crashes, and with his mask being damaged, the man of points tears it off to the reveal that he's John Wick? Yeah. The chopper then explodes and he wakes up to find Paxton Fettel standing over him. Point Man runs away through the streets for a bit and is then kidnapped by Armor Cam. So yeah, that's how Point Man got from Fear 1 to Fear 3 and I gotta say I'm a little bit more of a fan of these version of events over the uh, 9 page comic but hey. Maybe that's just me. Anyway, so the game actually begins nine months after the comic. We see Point Man is being interrogated by Armor Cam, who wants to know where Jin is hiding in Fairport for some reason. Paxton then shows up, possessing a guard and killing the other one, giving Point Man a chance to get free. And from here, our objective seems to become escape the prison, get to Fairport and save Jin, which is much to Paxton's dismay. I agree we must escape, but for her. Also, first nitpick of the game, the Armor Cam guys wanted to know where Jin was and seemed to have her radio frequency but didn't have her location. However, the second we get into the game, one of these armor cam earpieces has Jin sending out a distress call on it, saying that she's hiding in Fairport's underground tunnels. Like, why were you interrogating Point Man? It is blatantly obvious that the story of fear has been put through a blender of rewrites multiple times because as you'll see, objectives don't stay consistent, characters don't stay consistent. Hell, why are we going through this with a fine tooth comb? The story itself becomes a barely strung together series of events near the end. It's it's incredible. It's a masterclass of shit writing. Anyway, blasting our way through the prison, the first thing I want to talk about right away is the gameplay. Because if we take out all the expectations of how a fear game is meant to play, this thing has the best moment to moment in the series. Please don't unsubscribe, please. Point Man and Paxton's gameplay is the best stuff in this game. And that's kind of surprising considering that day one didn't want to do co-op. The way the whole thing works is is that Point Man operates as a kind of heavy damage class, while Paxton plays more of a support role. With PM, he's got all the usual tricks. You've got a couple of kicks, some grenades, guns, and slow motion, which would be boring the third time around if it's not for Paxton's effect on how you utilize these skills. Paxton has a pretty wide range of abilities to choose from. In his basic form, he can throw out stun blasts, but the real interesting stuff comes from his alternate ability. Pressing right click honestly does a lot of things. You can pick up grenades, barrels, anything that goes boom when it lands, and you can lob them any way you want. Holding right click on Point Man gives him a shield for a few seconds, holding right click on an enemy will pull it into the air for an easy target, and pressing control while holding an enemy in the air will... Yep, Paxton can possess people. These possessed bodies are on a timer though, meaning you have to kill and collect enemy stoles to stay in your current body. Although I never really understood the incentive to do this, since if you get kicked out of one body, you can just jump into a new one pretty soon afterwards. So yeah, considering I have two sentences on Point Man's abilities and two paragraphs on Paxton's, it's pretty clear who is the real star of Fear 3. Although it's not just about who's got the most solo utility, since using teamwork in this game 
is, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, a little bit overpowered. <laughs> like I was saying earlier, it seems like Point Man gets left in the dust in this game, but that's kind of not true depending on how you play it. If you play this game as a true co-op game, Point Man is just one element of the team. He's your consistent, reliable damage output, and usually the focus of the fight. Paxton, on the other hand, has an extremely varied kit that makes him super powerful, but in a team setting, most of it is used with the knowledge that Point Man will be getting hard focused by the AI. With your abilities, you have many choices on how you want to play off your partner. You could use Paxton's base offensive abilities and support shield to back up PM and work as an extra shooter while also mitigating any damage he might take to allow for more aggressive plays. You can run interference, possessing an enemy right in the middle of things and tearing up their formation from behind. Or you can do really anything. The fact that Point Man has a restrictive yet constant set of skills while Paxton has varying states of lethality allows for many options and team strategies. Strategies that the AI is not prepared for. So you know how I was talking about how these levels had to be retooled to allow for co-op? Well, it's kind of clear the enemy AI wasn't because if you work as a team in this game, instead of just shooting no matter what, this thing is bloody easy. I don't know if the GoApp system is still present in this game because the enemies once again lack options to move around in the levels, just like in Fear 2. There's also the added factor of Paxton. The AI just does not know how to handle a target just popping up right next to them, making them feel really, really stupid. Both Point Man and Paxton don't even need to respect the AI as much as the previous entries either. This is because the health kit system is gone, replaced with a Call of Duty type health regeneration. This means you can bum rush into any room, take a fuck ton of damage, but kill everybody, and it's all good. You don't have to think about how many med kits a high risk play will cost you. You don't have to think about if you should be using this much health in this area. This is because every fight is an individual trial where the game asks you if you can survive this one single room. And if you can, then good job. You get your health back and you get to continue. And it's not even like you have to survive the full room on one bar of health. If you're getting critical, just go hide in a corner, get back up to full health and get back in there. I'm telling you, man, the cards are so unbelievably stacked against the AI on this one. And I don't really know if anyone realized it during development. But yeah, that's mostly what Fear 3's gameplay is. I'll be the first to say it's really fun and one of the best things in this game. Like I never rolled my eyes going into a fight because it just feels really good to play. It's completely possible that the gameplay with this one is what makes it good bad because while Paxton might be speaking the worst dialogue ever written, you're also having fun shooting enemies. Anyway, so after shooting our way through the prison for a bit, it starts to crumble around us and we fall through the floor into the sewers. But why is this happening you might ask? All squads, small arms fire and trucks and some gas mains and it is affecting nearby power lines. Take your fire. Ah uh, yeah, a gas main just explodes because it does and uh, yeah, don't ask questions. Watch this cool Bioshock 2 cutscene. I gave you life. I mold you. Create you. Anyway, making our way through the sewers and some admittedly nice looking level design, we're ambushed by armor cam soldiers. And yes, the guy that you can see in slow motion just got hit in the face. His reflexes are totally off the charts. But before Armor Cam can arrest us again, they're all killed by some strange skinny looking monster that even Alma, who also shows up here, seems pretty scared of. Now ladies and gentlemen, when I talked about Fear 2, there was a point when I felt I didn't have much else to say and began talking about what I didn't like in the game. Back in my Burial at Sea video, I didn't even do moment to moment story breakdown because it wasn't really something that benefited the video. And here it's it's the same. I cannot give Fear 3 the retrospective treatment that I give other games. I've told you about the gameplay, but apart from that, there isn't much to this game. The story is disjointed, nonsensical, and it only really progresses during the beginning and end of a level. Which is really impressive because this game is four hours long, and yet a whole lot of nothing happens. So we're going to be changing gears. We have officially covered everything I think is pretty good about this game. And now all that's really left is 
is the story that shits all over the pre-existing canon. So what we'll be doing now is we'll be quickly going through the story, which shouldn't be hard because there isn't much that's going on here. And I'm going to tell you why this thing is so awful. So picking back up in the sewers, we exit it and we spend the rest of the level fighting through a Brazilian looking town before hijacking an armor cam helicopter and flying it to Fairport. On our way, a shockwave hits the helicopter and we crash into a department store where we have to fight against armor cam and cultists who have been driven insane by Alma. Through the level, we're attacked by the skinny creature a little more and once we exit the store, Paxton reads some cult scribbles and is suddenly very excited ending the chapter. Come. In the next one, the brothers roll up to the suburbs to find Jin, only to find that Army Cam is killing all the civilians in the area. And I bet you won't guess what we do for the whole level. Yep, we fight cultists and Army Cam. The skinny monster once again shows up to fight us, and it's revealed that it's Harlan Wade. And I will be talking about that point later. You better believe that. Paxton once again tells Point Man that he shouldn't be trying to save Jin, but conveniently, Jin radios in, telling everybody exactly where she is. So setting off, we fight some more Army Cam dudes and enter the tunnels where we find Jin. Jin. You. I knew you were alive. You'd come for me. All right. Yeah. Course. It turns out that she has some data that could ruin Alma Cam, and that data is uh, info on Michael Beckett, which is him saying that Alma is pregnant. Now at this point shit starts getting really wild and I think they might have stopped caring around this part because it's never even explained in the actual story but we're told in a little piece of text at the start of the next level that we need to find Beckett to find Alma for some reason. So heading off into the city, Jin gets kidnapped by some cultists and we have to go rescue her by, say it with me now, fighting through area after area of armor cam soldiers and cultists. In this level the game also tries to establish a villain with the phase commander being introduced as someone who has a very special interest in killing Point Man. Sometime during the level, we hear over the radio that Jin has been kidnapped from the cultists by Armor Cam, and the phase commander is now using her as bait for Point Man. So finding our way through Armor Cam and cultists, we run into Harlan Wade again, he talks some shit, and we finally make it to a tower where there's a giant rift opening over it for some reason, but that's not important because we get into a boss fight with the big man himself, the phase commander. <laughs> That's it. Killing him, another guy that sounds just like him and also hates Point Man just as much shows up. Killing him as well, Jin sends us off in an escape pod to go find Beckett. On the way to the airport where he's being shipped off, our pod crashes when another Alma energy surge hits it, and we spend the level fighting army cam dudes and weird dog enemies. This one is a little cooler since both Point Man and Paxton get an EPA, and in this game they've even added a shield feature. But we don't get to ride in them for long as the bridge we're stomping along collapses is sending Point Man tumbling down into the ocean. If this is part of your plan, then I'd say things are going quite swimmingly. <laughs> Okay, now we have been moving very fast, but I do want to put on the record that for the most part, most of the level transitions from one to the next have been, you know, more or less smooth. Well, I do have a question now. Do you think that after falling in the ocean, there's going to be a smooth transition to the next level or not? Place your bets. Let's see. <laughs> You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. So in the airport level, I don't really even need to say it. All you really do is fight armor cam dudes and nothing else really happens. Another phase commander does show up that hates Point Man just as much as the last two guys did. And we fight two more of them after this guy as well. Eventually we make it to the runway and fighting two more phase commanders, we finally make it to Beckett. And this scene is absolutely the reason why they hired famous director John Carpenter because 
it's not wasteful of characters, it's not bad writing or anything, it's just, it's perfect. Beckett is still pretty angry about what Alma did to him. Paxton then possesses Beckett and tells us everything about Project Harbinger that we already knew from the last game. He then dives into Beckett's memories again and witnesses from Beckett's perspective his own mum. I'm not even gonna finish that sentence, what the fuck? Paxton then finds what he needs, kills Beckett and gives us a really good Joker laugh. <laughs> In the next level, we pick up in an underground armor cam facility that was under Harlan Wade's house or something. I I, I don't even know. I don't even know how we got here. Also, I haven't really mentioned it yet, but between levels, we get a little Paxton narration over security footage showing Point Man and Paxton growing up together. And in this level, we have traveled back to this facility we've seen in these cutscenes to destroy all of our bad memories. Hey, don't look at me like that. I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what happened in the story. <laughs> Through the level, we're attacked by the skinny monster multiple times as the brothers destroy the memories of the things Harlan did to them. The level end game ends with a giant Harlan Wade monster boss fight. And killing him, Paxton says that they can finally see Alma now that the past isn't in their way anymore. Huh? Arriving at Alma's location, I, I don't even know what's going on here, but Paxton wants to eat Alma to gain unlimited power, while Point Man just wants to kill her and the child. What are you doing? This family never meant anything to you. Are you going to continue to follow the orders of that woman, or stay true to your own blood? The brothers then fight and the game tallies up each player's points through the game. Oh yeah, that's also something I didn't mention. Through the game, you get points by absorbing dead bodies and completing challenges and at the end of the game, whoever has the most points wins. In Fettel's ending, he possesses Point Man and promises to raise Alma's child as his own. He then, um eats Alma and that's it. In the Point Man ending, it's a little different but not much. Point Man puts three more bullets into Paxton's head, killing him. He then helps Alma deliver the baby before Alma herself dies. And Point Man leaves as Jin radios in saying things are going back to normal. And that is the story of Fear 3. Time to complain. The story of Fear 3 is one of the worst constructed, most embarrassing attempts at creating a trilogy I think I have ever seen in video games. It doesn't know what it wants to do. It doesn't know what it wants to be. The game totes itself through its cutscenes as some deep reflection on what it means to be family, but it falls flat because that is not what Fear is about. Now, before we actually get into the actual characters, can we just talk about how hideous all of the characters actually look in this game? Like, what happened here? They've pushed Paxton's hairline up a couple of inches, Jin looks like she's a walking, talking doll, and Point Man, holy fuck, what, what is wrong with his model? Every time I see this thing, I think I'm going crazy because no one else seems to see how hideous this guy is. It's weird because he looks fine in live action, his model looks fine in promotional stuff, but in game and in cutscenes, I, like, I, I don't even know what to say. Why are his eyes so lifeless? Like the phase commander calls Point Man an inbred multi multiple times in the game and it has me wondering if this horrible face was a deliberate design choice or not. Like, someone tell me I'm not alone here. I can't find anyone that agrees with me. The only place on the internet that seems to have something to say about Point Man's face is this Reddit post that says he looks like the guy from Ice Age. But moving past the looks, I want to talk about the actual characters in the game. And let's get started with Paxton. Last time we saw this guy was in Fear 2 Reborn when he gets resurrected into the body of Foxtrot 813. But this game ignores that DLC in both the comic and the game. Like in the first cutscene, Paxton Paxton literally explains how he's still alive. When my brother found me, he put a bullet in my head, but our psychic link never broke. So it didn't have anything to do with the fact that you transferred your consciousness into a replica body. Okay. Another bit of evidence is that in the prequel comic written by Steve Niles, right after the chopper crashes, Paxton shows up to taunt Point Man. But there is no way he could be alive at this point since the replicas 
hadn't reactivated yet and fear 2 reborn can only happen after the point in fear 2 when the replicas activate in interval 4 so fear 3 absolutely ignores the only interesting part of fear 2 and if you need any more evidence on why paxton is not possessing the body of foxtrot 813 even though he should be i present to you this guy's massive bullet hole in his head what else do you need now i want to talk about paxton's personality too but to do that we need to talk about point man's because through the campaign, this is the only guy Paxton yaps onto. Really, a big problem with Point Man is that he is still a nothing character. He is canonically mute, and now his character is actually a huge part of the story. But what story? Paxton spends a lot of the game talking to Point Man about family. But what are you talking about, dude? Think of it like this. Point Man knows Paxton from the one day he spent chasing him in Fear 1, and he also knows Alma from the one day she spent spent chasing him around in Fear 1. Fear 3 all of a sudden establishes that Point Man and Paxton grew up together until PM was 11 and Paxton was 10. As far as I can tell, Paxton kind of went catatonic after the synchronicity event, but what about Point Man? All I can really find is that he was sent off into the military. There's no reason he shouldn't remember Paxton. But either way, in Fear 1, it's pretty heavily established and implied that these two motherfuckers don't really know each other. I mean, isn't that the point of the game? One of the big reveals at the end is that Paxton Fettel is Point Man's brother and this was their first time really figuring that out? You and I were born from the same mother. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that one of the elements of the reveal in Fear 1? How weird it is that they're brothers and yet they know nothing of each other? Isn't that also the connection that Point Man had to Alma? One of the aspects of that reveal was that she's his mother and he's never met her. Is, is, wasn't that what this is about? But now it's like, we've known each other for years. By the end of the first game, we know they're brothers, but they're not brothers, just like Alma is PM's mother, only in a biological sense. What's clear is that we have a massive ambiguity issue here. We don't know how Point Man feels because he doesn't talk, and we really don't know much of his history. As well as that, we don't know how Paxton feels because his character is pretty inconsistent in this series. This makes the Main debate in the story kind of hollow. Paxton is trying to establish something with Point Man, but all Point Man can do is give him a mean look for the whole thing because, you know, why not? There's no tension here because character conflicts in stories only works when you know things about your characters. The audience must have some knowledge about both of the characters that are clashing and they need to give both characters the ability to add new cards onto the deck that is your conflict. But we don't know much about point man and he doesn't have the ability to express himself making this main kind of debate about the uh, importance of family a little bit useless because only Paxton can keep going oh you're such a bad brother and well point man he can't even say like Dude, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> it's kind of like if Valve ever tried to make Alex and Gordon Freeman an official couple. They can't because it'll imply that Gordon is a character with his own thoughts and feelings and suddenly the player will be a part of this story where they're only getting one side of this entire interaction. It's really strange that the whole story is about family when Paxton is the only one that can really actually contribute anything. These guys don't trust each other. You have one brother who's effectively mute and he's a super soldier and dangerous and brooding and you have the other brother who is a psychopath and one killed the other. So you put those together and you get a pretty good story. <laughs> wow! Oh, that's some kind of logic right there. Point Man doesn't talk, Alma barely shows up in the game and barely does anything, and Harlan Wade isn't even real. Oh yeah, that's something we haven't talked about yet. Harlan Wade and character assassination. Now, I cannot believe I'm about to defend Harlan here, but he is portrayed as comically evil in this game. Pretty much, Skinny Monster Thing is called The Creep, and it's a manifestation of the memory of Harlan Wade, and that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Through the game, Harlan non-stop taunts you, calling the brothers failures, and he just doesn't shut up. He's not even saying any valid points. He's just saying evil, nasty things because the game wants to tell you that he's an evil and nasty guy. I gave you life. Okay, I just want to lay this out real quick. Harlan Wade 
is a bad guy. In the law, he canonically hands over his daughter to the corporation he works for in order to study her abilities. He then uses her to create two prototypes, which he uses to try and benefit this corporation. He's a piece of shit. There's no two ways around it. This game not only brings him back as the main villain after he died an entire game ago, but they dive into a Harlan Wade character study where the only finding is that Harlan is a piece of shit. The game says, look, Harlan experimented on kids. Look how mean he is and look how he's not even remorseful now. What? Harlan Wade is the only reason Alma was released from the Origin facility. He was so guilt ridden about what he did to Alma that he released her at the expense of his own life. Did they forget about that fact? If you want to do a Harlan Wade character study, you shouldn't be telling us what we already know. Personally, I'm more interested in the other side of this whole thing. Why is Harlan the way he is? What made him the kind of guy that would experiment on his own daughter? Like if you're gonna resurrect the character, why not tell us something new about him rather than how mean he was? Also, why did he feel so guilty about what he did to Alma, but he didn't seem to care about his two sons slash grandsons that he kept in his basement for like 10 years? Also, just another bit of salt on the wound, when you defeat Harlan at the end of the game, he says this. My children, Alma, you were to be my legacy, but you are all monsters. I absolutely hate this because this is Harlan's final send off in the series and he's pretty much saying, I regret nothing, this is all your fault goodbye. That is not Harlan's character at all. Somehow they've taken a guy whose whole character arc was that he was completely guilty and remorseful about what he did to Alma and they have taken the story arc that he had in both fear games and they've just undone it. How did they undo it? They made a fake version of the character and they made him not remorseful for anything the real one did. Like, what are the stakes here? You've beaten an imaginary version of a person? This is like me having an imaginary argument with someone in the shower and winning. Like, it means nothing. If you're going to try and say that Harlan Wade, this was who Harlan Wade was, then you've just gone and disregarded his whole actual character. I just don't know why you had to scrounge around in the lore, find a dead character, undo his story, story just to make him the main villain when you have a good main villain right in the game called the phase commander that they completely waste. For a little refresher, the phase commander is the guy you run into in the city level. And when he's introduced, it seems like he might be the big bad of the game. For the whole level, he's talking about how Point Man is a mistake, that he needs to be erased. He talks like he has some kind of personal stake in all this. He even kidnaps Jin to force Point Man to come to him. Like that is some arch nemesis stuff right there, man. Just ignore the fact that Point Man's canonically only worked with Jin for like one week in the universe. He barely knows her, but whatever. But yeah, you fight the phase commander, you kill him, and then another rolls up. I just don't get it because the multiple phase commanders that show up in the game do the whole shit talking thing with Point Man, and yet they're all apparently different guys. This legitimately feels like a mistake. Like the phase commander originally had to be one guy and had a way bigger role. Personally, and this is just an idea, but why not make him Beckett? In the game, Beckett shows an extreme disgust towards Point Man and his whole family. Like he's got the motive to hate Point Man and hunt down Alma, right? WB, hire me as a writer. Actually, wait, don't, I don't wanna work for you. Speaking of Beckett, what the fuck? Good old Mike has to be the worst treated protagonist in gaming history. Like the dude goes through Fear 2, is held captive for nine months, and then these two goobers show up and kill him just to find out where Alma is. But can we pause here for a second? How? would Beckett know where Alma is? On the security cameras, it seems like she dipped right after the final scene of Fear 2. So how, just how would possessing Beckett and looking through his memories get them anywhere? It's, it's not even explained at any point during the game. And I mean, what am I really surprised for? There is no part of this campaign that is shown in the cutscenes or the gameplay that serves as a logical progression for the campaign. I mean, just 
Think about it. Point Man and Paxton have to find Jin, so they fly to Fairport, they fuck around for a bit until they hear from her again and head into the tunnels. Jin then says, holy crap guys, Alma's pregnant and she's gonna tear Fairport apart if we don't find her. Good thing we know where Beckett is, go find him. We then chase a kidnapped Jin all through Fairport and once she's rescued, she sends us off to find Beckett like she'll be okay in this city that is literally falling apart around her. Once we make it to Beckett, Paxton possesses him and it's just like, yeah, this is the father. And somehow because of this information, they automatically know that they have to go to the facility where they grew up as kids. Like these guys go from the middle of the city, which was crawling with armor cam, by the way, to the middle of the woods with no indication of how we got there or, you know, why we're even there. We then have to defeat the bad memories of Harlan Wade before we can finally see Alma. Like, am I missing some crucial bit of lore here? Nothing in this game makes any sense. It's just a bunch of loosely strung together scenarios that is justified by poorly written characters that just spell out the obvious. How the fuck did we actually get from the quality of writing and depth of story and gameplay and graphics and ambience of Fear 1 to this piece of shit? That this doesn't even feel real. It does not feel like a real game. Hey guys, B4 Brandos from the future. I'm going to interrupt this video to bring you something I have just found. So I was looking around on the internet for some footage to put over the day one part of my video. And I found this old promotional channel for Fear 3. Now this channel is a treasure trove of Fear 3 development footage. There is so much on this, but we have this guy, community manager named Anthony Williams, who I think manage this channel. Now, Anthony did a bunch of stuff, did a bunch of these promotional videos, but he did something called the Day One Studios Virtual Tour. Now, a lot of this tour is pretty normal. He just goes around to all the different departments, shows everybody what's going on. Not only do they have a full-size mirror I can check myself out with, they also animate the models, they're living. But at the end of the tour, he goes to the big boss's office and he looks at a script page on the wall, which shows how unbelievably different this game was meant to be. Now, this was about a year before Fear 3 actually released, but this shows just how extensive the rewrites were. Let's go through this. So this scene seems to pick up in the power station. So this is the part of the game where you actually meet up with Jin, except here, it looks like Jin and Kira Stokes from Fear 2 bust through a door with their rifles shouldered. All of a sudden, dust swirls through the beams of their flashlights. Jin says, damn it, Beckett is not here. We have to secure the implantation from his encounter with Alma in the reactor. So we're assuming that's the end of Fear 2. Stokes says, the exchange went both ways, as well as causing a great deal of physical damage and mental deterioration. All of a sudden, Michael Beckett says, a loving encounter with greatness would change you too. Jin and Stokes turn to see Alma walk out of the shadows as fire burns around her. She, and this part is crazy. She holds a leash in each hand. One is attached to Beckett, who is pregnant and scarred by psychic energy. And Point Man, long-haired and bearded, is attached to the other. Alma then speaks, but it is in the voice of Fettel. And she says, welcome ladies. Point Man then pulls out his leash and it snaps. He runs after Jin and Stokes. It then cuts to gameplay. So this single page is insane. It shows just how different the game was meant to be and how obvious it is that rewrites just happen on the fly. I mean, Kira Stokes, who in the monolith timeline is officially dead because she doesn't show up. She's here in this game. It seems like Jin has a lot more to do with this. And it, it even seems like maybe the campaign might have been you playing as Jin and Stokes. And also, Beckett is the one that is pregnant in this version. Like, holy crap, man. This, is, this game is just something else. Anyway, I don't really know what to do with this information. It sounded like the previous version of the script either was going to be like balls to the wall insane and would have been awesome or would have been fucking horrible. <laughs> anyway, uh, pass B4 Brandos, uh, keep complaining. Another bone I have to pick with this game is a rather simple question. 
Where the hell is Fear? Yeah, Fear. You know the organization that the games are named after? In Fear 1, you played as an operative. Nice. In the non-canon expansions, you were still an operative. Nice. In Fear 2, they thought they weren't allowed to use that word, so you play as a Delta Force operator. Okay. But in Fear 3, there is nothing stopping them from reintroducing the organization. I can deal with the fact that you don't play as one of their agents. I can deal with the fact that Point Man isn't in it anymore. But what do you mean they don't show up at all? It's, it's almost like they're embarrassed to talk about it. It's really weird. Jin introduces herself as a fear operative on the radio. The phase commander calls both Point Man and Jin fear operatives. But where has fear actually gone? What is Jin still doing in the city? Did fear just leave after the origin explosion? Did fear leave Jin there? Was Jin there on a mission? If so, what was it? Like seriously, where is fear? Are you telling me you have access to this organization and you're not gonna use it in the game? Another thing the series has lost here is quite a bit of atmospheric identity. Fairport has never been the focus of the fear games. It's just a nothing city to serve as a backdrop for the game. But as the games have gone on, the city has developed a bit of a personality in my opinion. A personality that is fully stripped away in Fear 3. The ambience is just gone. The urban decay that was present in the earlier games is gone. That dark, suffocating vibe that Fairport gives off is no longer there. There's barely any continuity between Fear 2's Fairport and this one, because I'll tell you, this place sure as hell does not look like a new kid. Fear overall just does a lot of losing. It loses the atmosphere, it loses the tension, it misses the chance to pursue interesting ideas like the Almaverse. And yes, I haven't brought up the Almaverse before, but this is pretty much how all of the paranormal monsters in the games exist. Alma's psychic abilities gives her a connection to another universe. It's kind of like a strange corrupted version of our world. The best example would be the Upside Down in Stranger Things, and yet it is never explored as a concept. Even in this game, where Alma is literally ripping the veil between her world and ours in half, no one seems to give a shit about the actual interesting storytelling opportunities here. It feels so weird that Fear 3 is a competent shooter, and yet everything else that it tries to do is overshadowed by its blatant disregarding of everything that came before it. It's like it doesn't even want to be a fear game, and that would make sense. It's not really even that scary. They hire me to write scary things, and then when you write something scary, they're like, oh, we can't, you know, that's too much. And I didn't have that with these, with these guys. Hey, I'm not surprised. The worst crime it commits is that it tries to draw on the nostalgia of the previous game's plots without committing to the specifics of the lore they created. It's downright a baffling piece of media to compare to the previous two games. But hey, let's take it back a gear here because you're not gonna believe this. Fear as an organization actually does show up in the game. It's just in the multiplayer. And now you're double not gonna believe this. Multiplayer is actually the best part of Fear 3. As opposed to the previous games, Fear 3 embraces its co-op aspects, instead of just going for your run-of-the-mill PvP slog. In total, there are four game modes. Contractions, Soul King, Soul Survivor, and Fucking Run. Yep, that's the actual name of the game mode. Starting off, Contractions is COD Zombies. There's nothing else to it. You survive waves and waves of armor cam soldiers, and occasionally there will be a round where Alma Dogs come after you. There are a few things here that stop this from being a COD Zombies clone though. Weapons can't be bought but instead need to be found. Between waves you can find yellow and red crates spread around the arena. Yellow restocks your holdout while red adds new weapons. The last cool thing about this mode is that sometimes you can even see Alma walking around and if you stare at her she'll damage you and teleport you to some random point in the map. So yeah, cool stuff. Like it. Soul King is my favorite game mode, and in it you take control of a Spectre, which is a spirit who has a watered down version of Paxton's abilities. And your goal here is to compete against other players playing as Spectres and collect the most souls. The way you do this is by possessing NPCs and, well, killing other NPCs. If you come across another Spectre or a Spectre possessing a body, it turns into a kind of PvP deal. After that, there's not a whole lot to it. It's just really fun. The Spectre design is horrifying and I love how much they yap throughout the rounds. All the joys of a beating heart. This one will do nice. 
Soul Survivor is a PvPVE game mode. Pretty much a majority of players play as fear operatives who need to defend themselves until extraction arrives, while one other person plays as a spectre whose job it is to corrupt the team. You can do this by possessing NPCs, downing team members, and then turning those members into spectres. And I could see it being fun, but I just didn't have enough players in the match to get the full experience. Finally, fucking run is what it sounds like. There's a wall of death behind you, you have to run away, and on the path there is a bunch of NPCs that try to kill you. It's okay, but I will say it's one of the worst game modes. Not because it's bad, it's just not very interesting. And that could be said for a lot of my Fear 3 multiplayer experience, because this thing has been well and truly left to rot. I don't know what kind of server in the abandoned day one offices is still keeping this game alive, but trust me, it's on its last legs. If you play Fear 3 today, you are not going to be able to get into co-op without some serious determination. For whatever reason, the servers allow players to be connected for around two minutes before booting them out of the game, no matter what. So getting the footage for this multiplayer section was really hard because there's no land mode and out of the three others I had trying to play, the server eventually only accepted one. This is the same for the campaign as well. When I streamed this game with my friend Preston, shameless plug, go check out B5 Brandos if you want to see the highlights. We spent an entire hour trying to get this thing to work because the only strategy that lets you play is brute force. As long as you keep reconnecting, once you get into a lobby that lets you stay for five minutes, you're good. But I was determined. I was doing this for a video. Any like average dude that wants to play Fear 3, they're pretty much being told no at the door. So yeah, that's Fear 3. It's weird because I thought this video would be longer. I thought I'd have more to say, but after playing all the games these last few weeks, I've found that there's just not much to say once you get to this point. WB took a studio and forced it to throw out what it had to make this game, but they weren't happy even with that. That. Everything needed to be what was cool with the kids. Less horror, more co-op, make it more like Call of Duty. There's so little to say about Fear 3 because it's not really a fear game, it's, it's a rip-off. It's a shallow imitation of a series of games that are way better than itself. Fear 2 looks like a fucking masterpiece compared to Fear 3 and it's just downright depressing. People that had no business giving input on this game got an insane amount of control over it and when it failed because of their input, they just backed up and said, fear must just not be popular anymore. Yeah, it's just sad and disappointing because it's such a clear example of not living up to the legend. All those questions posed, all those story threads that were set up in Fear 1 are either thrown away by this point or they're answered in a way that tells me nothing other than the fact that the person coming up with those answers and resolutions doesn't give a shit about any of this. Fear 3 is embarrassing. It's disrespectful to the legacy of the series. It's just really bad in a way that can be fun in the moment, but in the grand scheme of the series, it just comes off as being kind of pathetic. And because of that, because of everything I've talked about, I am giving Fear 3 a 2 out of 10. I'm really shocked at some of the stuff they, they let us get away with. Me too, kid. And that's the Fear series, and it looks like we've talked about every game, so I think we're just a... Hello? Oh. The audience will riot if I don't talk about it. Okay. You guys ever heard of something called Fear Online? So Fear 3 was not actually the last time the IP was in use. That honor goes to the now defunct 2014 game called Fear Online. Now I wanna give you an idea of the fear landscape at this time. Monolith was pretending Fear 3 never happened. TimeGate Studios, the people who made the original expansions, went bankrupt the previous year. Day One Studios doesn't exist and has been bought up by the world of tanks people. The Fear IP at this point is considered shit. Every developer that's ever touched it that isn't Monolith doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't bring success. But there was a brave little studio that rejected this. A little dev studio called InPlay Interactive that endeavored to create an online fear experience. Now this thing will go down as one of the most poorly documented fear games out there because despite my best efforts, there is no way to play this game 
at all because the servers are down meaning you can't get any of the content but after doing some research i have found some info fear online had two modes pvp where it was delta force and fear versus armor cam and co-op where there were three co-op story missions to play one took place in a new york armor cam facility another took place in a random tunnel and the third took place on still island during the events of fear 2. as far as i can tell these weren't meant to be canon and honestly weren't really interesting interested in telling a story, but I still find the opening cutscene really funny, like how intense do you need your zoom to be? <laughs> From the research I have done, it definitely seems like Fear Online earned its fate. It was a free to play shooter, but you needed tickets to play matches. And you guessed it, you could either buy these tickets or you could wait a day to get a new one. Like someone told me that is not the worst free to play model you've ever heard of. So yeah, that was what Fear Online was. And it's kind of sad that the series went out not only with a whimper, but with a shitty cash grab game. Oh, and if you're wondering about the Fear IP curse, In Play Interactive is seemingly still around but their website is pretty broken right now and it seems like they haven't done anything since 2020 so who knows maybe the last bastion has fallen here okay let's wrap this up we've finally made it to the end of our journey through this series or through this hours long video we've looked at where fear started where they tried to take the sequel and what could have been with the expansions of the original we've analyzed the mishandling of the ip by the publishers with fear 3 and quickly looked over the dying embers of the series that fear online represented and all up i have to say that this series makes me feel sad back in the day when i was playing these iconic series on my crappy laptop people would ask me about the game series i liked and i'd tell them i like half-life i like bioshock i like fear it was strange because with that original entry with that first exposure you could feel that this was meant to be one of the greats this series could have been about far more than just armor cam and alma and point man it could have been special long running and respected but instead it wound up here i can't say i fully loved the fear series because i know that all the potential i felt in the first game peters out into nothing there's no payoff there's no satisfying conclusion there's just the skeleton of an ip that a publisher saw money in fear as a series shows that it is possible to fumble success no matter how well you make something you always have to put in the effort for the next one nothing is guaranteed with video games especially especially not success. Personally, this is just wishful thinking on my part, but I'd like to see a reboot of the series one day. Not a reboot that treads old ground, but a reboot that explores the original potential of the original concept. Imagine a game where you play as fear operatives going from one paranormal encounter to the next. It would be awesome, and with today's current reboot culture, it is possible. But until then, fear is unfortunately an example of wasted potential. Hello everybody and thank you for watching the video, I really appreciate it. I'm gonna do the YouTuber thing now. Can you please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video? And if you really, really wanna see more videos from me, please click that bell notification so that you actually see when I make new videos. I don't know why YouTube says, oh, this guy subscribed, probably doesn't wanna see the next video. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, this has been a quite the journey to make all of these fear videos. It's uh, been a lesson in talking about things that I don't have, you know, insane passion about. You know, I, I usually do videos on things I have passion about. Fear 1, I'm very passionate about that. But the rest of the series, especially Fear 2, uh, I really just don't really like that game. So this has been an excellent kind of journey on how to uh, talk about things from a more analytical perspective rather than just raw passion you know like oh this is what got me through my childhood that kind of thing so i hope you've all enjoyed it um more content coming soon obviously i'll let you go now uh go watch some other youtube videos i'll see you see you later <laughs> <laughs>